Welcome to Game Face, episode 36, the flagship show of Sifted Games. We sit here today with extremely heavy hearts. Uh, as many of you probably know, Game Trailers was shut down for good this week, just a couple days ago. Pretty big shock to, I think, everybody. Um, Especially the people who work there. Yeah, particularly the people who work there, and our good friend Daniel Bloodworth, who was on his honeymoon when everything went down. That was really nice of them to do that. Um, <laughs> Obviously, you guys know I worked there for seven plus years. Uh, it's been weighing on me a lot the last couple of days. Um, we're going to dedicate a lot of time towards the end of the show to talking about GT and what happened. And uh, now that GT doesn't exist anymore, I also feel a little more free to kind of talk about all kinds of stuff that happened there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe explain some things a little further. Uh, you know, some of the stuff that led to me leaving and some things like that, uh, we're going to get into. We also want to make it a little bit of a celebration of game trailers. Um, when I was putting together the montage for uh, our discussion about GT, uh, I was just blown away by, one, all the awesome people that worked at game trailers, uh, but, two, at the work that everybody there did. Like, we created so many awesome things at GT. It was just mind-blowing. Just I tried to get a little bit of footage from almost every show uh, that we ever had on GT and put it together into one piece of video that'll run as Matt and I kind of talk about it. So we are going to talk a ton about GT. I am repping Invisible Walls today on the show. Um, obviously, I, that yeah, I never worked at Game Trailers, but I have my equivalent defunct shutdown media outlet. Yeah, so, so if you guys don't know, before I worked at uh, Game Trailers, I worked with Matt at G4 on X-Play mm -hmm. and a bunch of other stuff, our E3 yeah. coverage and everything. And so I mean, Matt, I never, Yeah, I never worked at GT, but I knew everybody pretty much. You yeah. and Ryan Stevens and Probably been, Hoffman. And, yeah, because a lot of those people that I took to GT, I actually poached from you G4. You know, I came from G4. So yeah. like, if you didn't work on X, especially once G4 started moving away from video game-centric, you know, Full scheduled programming. Yeah. If you didn't work on X Play, you pretty much went to GT. Yeah, I hired away Ryan Stevens, as you guys all know, Jeremy Hoffman, who was a producer on Game Trailers TV for Spike. I hired away from G4. Our post production supervisor, Bobby Burns, he's actually let go from G4, and yeah. I hired him like the next Which day. Was stupid. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and like our, our almost everyone, our line producer, Elisa Cheese, I brought over yeah. from G4, a lot of people. So in a lot of ways, GT was kind of like the next evolution of G4. So, and Matt knows. Knew pretty much the whole staff that yeah. worked at uh, GT. So he does have a very personal connection to the site as well, and he understands a lot of what happened there. Obviously, we're really good friends, and I've talked about a lot of this stuff. So he will be very helpful. Hopefully, he'll keep me from crying, and he'll keep me grounded, because <laughs> just starting this show, I was starting to feel it in my chest a little bit. I was starting to get a little weepy. So not an easy week for any of us. Um, and I, I think this will be therapeutic for everybody involved. I know a lot of people are kind of mourning Whoa. the loss of GT. We got Bloodworth in the house. Daniel Bloodworth, or if you're in the chat, man, I don't know why you're on the chat <laughs> on your honeymoon. But uh, we do appreciate you showing up if that's really you in there, man. Because this stuff is our lives, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully we won't keep you too long and uh, you can get back to actually trying to enjoy yourself. Uh, much respect to you, Bloodworth. You know I've got mad love for you. So... Let's move on. We do have six topics of the big six. Uh, the last topic is going to be us talking about GT in depth, uh, but let's get to it. All right, we're going to talk about XCOM 2 first. We maybe should have talked about it last week, but neither one of us really had a chance to it play yet. it. Yeah. I honestly haven't played it yet either. I've been playing a couple of smaller <coughs> indie games this week, uh, but Matt has been playing it, and I did play all the XCOMs leading up to this one, so I have a good frame of reference to kind of probe your brain a little mm -hmm. bit on this game. I think, Matt, what I would want to set it up with first is, what is different about XCOM 2 from the prior games? Um, at core, not a whole lot. <laughs> um, but basically, um, you know, because the premise is that, the, you know, the, that you lost uh, the first game, the previous game, and uh, the aliens have taken over the country, the world for 20 years, and now you're sort of running this sort of uh, clandestine guerrilla operation to take the world back. So there's much more emphasis on, like, 
you have to get this done in a certain amount of time. So like a lot of missions have a time limit. A lot of the individual kind of non-story missions are procedurally generated. So there's a not a time limit. Yes, yeah, so that's not, pretty. That's new, definitely. It is new. like there's a lot of times you'll have a situation where you got to get to the thing, the objective within a certain number of turns, or it'll blow up, or the aliens will take it, or or you have to rescue a certain number of civilians before the aliens kill more of them than you're supposed to rescue, or you you're supposed to defend something that like the aliens are trying to destroy, so you have to get to it and fend them off before they destroy something. Um, so there's a lot more stuff that's like they're really trying to. Force now how does that time to... work? That timing work? Like when I play these this game and this series in particular, I am very methodical. And like there are oh, some yeah. times where I look at a move for like ten minutes before oh, yeah. I actually pull the trigger. And there's, well, there's and there's no limit on you know how long you decide your moves for. Oh, okay. But it's like but you have to do it in like you know usually there's like like a like a anywhere from like a six to twelve turn limit on a lot of these things. And so like. Whereas my instant, yeah, I, the first XCOM I played was the second one, Terror from the Deep, uh, which I found on my college girlfriend's computer. And I was like, oh, what's this? And Why like, did she have was, that? <laughs> because of a new computer, it came with it. Oh, it God. Came, and so she was playing Myst, and I was like, what's this XCOM thing? Uh, and so we played through that whole thing. And so I played, I really liked XCOM. Like the, but the way I play XCOM, certainly the way I played the last game, is I crawl through that shit. You know, like you, every, you know, you, you, you move slowly through that level, and like you know, they, they tried to, to speed you as much as they could in the, the last one with the meld. Like you had to get to the meld right. before it would, uh, you know, disintegrate or whatever, and yeah. then you wouldn't get it. But this one is like, you don't do this, you fail. And like, if you fail, it's not like it's the end of the world. You just have to get out. You have to extract, right? And, you know, so it's not like you lose your guys or like it's the end of the world. But you, you know, there's again like a doom track similar to. Uh, the last game, and if you screw up too much and don't succeed enough, you're not going to have the materials or the research to stand up to the end game. So, which I haven't gotten to yet, but I have already have a few friends who have gotten through their first playthrough and said, "Yeah, I failed miserably, and the aliens destroyed me, and now I'm going through with a totally different game plan on the second playthrough." So, it does sort of expect you to abort, retry, fail, and and the time limit sort of forces you to make. Uh, at times, it makes you force you to make stupid decisions, like. Because there's things where it's like, well, you gotta move, or you're not gonna get to this thing in time, or you're not gonna get to that civilian before they kill it, or like, you know. And then like, you know, I've ended, I ended up in a lot of situations where I, you know, had to move up, and I moved up, and oh, that was the worst possible place I could have moved. Uh, you know, the aliens came around the corner, and all of a sudden we're in this horrible firefight. And then I grievously got, I got one of my best guys grievously wounded, and then he's out of the action for like 22 game days. Um, which changes the next four missions very. That's very a strongly. lot longer than they would typically yeah. be lost for. Yeah, you the the injuries last a lot longer in this game uh, in game in terms of in game days, uh, which I don't actually mind because the end result of that has been I use I don't use the same four guys or five guys over and over. Um, like I'm really using newbies more often to fill the gaps, and if they survive the mission, like I've got another like you know guy on the guy on the rise, you know. And one time, they, one of the guys, the new guys they gave me, looks exactly like Guile from Street Fighter. <laughs> so like, like the, ha- the the hair, Guile uh-huh. hair is in it. He's got the he's got the green outfit and the and the aviator shades, and he's straight he's straight up Guile. And I'm just like, all right, Guile's on my team now. Great. <laughs> um, so and you can create any kind of like weirdo looking soldier, however you want. We're doing how, you know what and and the, there's a lot of armor options. There's more coming with the expansions this summer. You can like export your guys and like download your friends and it's like. You know. Here's a question I want to ask you though, because the first XCOM, well, the the modern rework of right. XCOM anyway. When I first started playing it, I was really concerned about my soldiers, and you, you're mm-hmm. right. Like I customized them and I built them up, and you know, kind of create an attachment to these guys. Oh yeah. But then by the end of the game, I realized that they were also disposable. That caring about mm-hmm. them was almost a mistake. And yeah. it got to the point where, like, I just looked at them as just rank and file, like, all of them. And because it's so easy for them to get killed, and if you don't want to, like, load up an old save and fight the whole battle, like, mm-hmm. after a while, I just got to the point where I didn't really care about the whole, like, permadeath soldier thing. And I just, because you're always getting so many new recruits once your base mm-hmm. gets to a certain place. And, like, well, here's the thing is, um, you know, I, I tend to maintain an attachment to, like, a lot of the originals. Like, the original, like, eight or nine are kind of my core team. But if I, you know, right now, if I'm on a mission and like one of the guys that is new, if I'm you know filling in a slot for an injured soldier and it's like a, a newbie, um, like if they get killed, I don't really care, you know. But but if it's one of my main guys, here's the thing: the game seems to know that you're gonna do that because it auto saves constantly. Like I mean, 
after every move almost. And so like if anything wow. goes wrong, like just look at the last autosave, load it up, take the move. Oh, that's back. that's good. Like, so the game like saves scums for you. It basically. also looks like it's self-aware and it realizes that yeah. maybe this was a problem with prior games. Yeah, that's kind of maybe the also maybe the balance for kind of, you know, cuz there's the term the turn limit can be, you know, um uh, aggravating, especially with the procedurally generated missions where sometimes like you know, the computer didn't quite take into, you know, there's been a couple where I'm like, I'm pretty sure they were unwinnable. Like, there's one in particular, particular I had to get to some power like source thing. Like you mean thing. just period. Yeah, like it was a power source <laughs> thing I had to get to before it blew up in like a certain number of turns, and it was so far away that I'm pretty sure if I sent one of my guys sprinting, like double timing the whole way, he could have made it, but I couldn't do that because there's enemies between that right, and me. Right, right. So like in the end, it just blew up and I had to evacuate after I killed the aliens. Which, like, you know, I still got some corpses to trade on the black market that way, but, like, it, it was real. It, it annoys me that, like, everything is in a winnable situation. Uh, especially when the winnable situation was like, could you drop us off a block further? Like, just, you know, <laughs> like, you know, and eventually you get, like, you know, better recon options and stuff, but early on, especially because it does, you know, you remember in the, in the previous game, it kind of, like, railroaded you through, like, a tutorial section yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, at least until Enemy Within let you skip it. But, like, you know, it really sort of, like, dragged you from one place to the other to show you how everything worked. In this one, you can kind of go off the rails a little qu sooner and, like, go scan stuff and sort of, you know, ignore the story a little earlier. Uh, and doing that ended up being uh, a bad idea, at least for me, because I kept ending up in, in these missions where I'm like, I think you expect me to have abilities that I don't have, you know, like, situations where I'm like, you know, it says, you know, difficulty easy, and it's like the fifth thing I've done, but like, you know, five turns in, two of my guys are mind controlled, one guy is panicking, and my sniper's on the roof just hoping she can take out, like, the, the guy who's mind controlling the, the, the Gatling gun dude, and then the Gatling gun dude came out of that, like, with some kind of like PTSD, so he like has no confidence in himself <laughs> right, anymore, right. and so like he's super easy to get mind control. But then I developed an anti mind control device that I equipped him with, so he does. That's not such a problem anymore. But I have to like put him in missions so he like builds his confidence again. So there is still like the rock paper scissors system where anything yeah. that happens to your guys, there's something that you can do to counteract. That. There's usually some kind of at least way to mitigate it, if not eliminate it. Now, and is there still a failed like game state in this game where like something can happen and like basically your game is done and you I'm, have to start all I think over. So. Like, there's a there's a thing where there's a project the aliens are working on that is the equivalent of the you know in the in the original game the pre previous game you had the doom track on the world map where if like you let too many nations go into panic like it basically like went crazy and the guy from uh, honest trailers yelled at you <laughs> and uh, in this one uh, you've got like this track similar track but it tracks um, how far along the aliens are with uh, this, like, mysterious super project that's... And I assume that if I let that max out before I'm, like, you know, researched and teched up enough, uh, it's going to just cr squash me like a bug. Right. So and it's, a lot it, of times when you get to that fail state, like, you're good luck finding a save that you can go back to. to yeah, the, to, the, in, the impression I've gotten It's like from, a snowball. At that right. point, it's pretty much impossible. The impression I've gotten from my friends who have already gone through that at this point is, like... Um, Basically, like, yeah, you're done. Like, yeah. I, you, like, you'd have to go back to undo. Usually, if like they're like, oh, if I'd have to go back so far to undo my mistakes, it made more sense to just start over. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's not a tremendously long game in that regard. If you like, kind of jam through it, and like, of course, there's that's a whole... surprising to hear. So uh, I mean, I guess it's as long as you want it to be. Yeah. And, and, and well, like... you could make it last a lifetime. Oh, probably. sure. And uh, you know, and of course, there's all the mods. That, you know, I'm sure the, you know, the long war. Uh, mod for the first game, which you know made it harder and longer and uh, a little a little less um, trade offy, I would say. But like it also meant that you ha you know the ex in exchange for like kind of those either or choices, which are also in this one. Like there's a lot of stuff where it's like, okay, we've got intel that says um, the aliens are either are going to attack our home base or they're going to like take out this, this like, re resistance cell in, like, Moscow. Right. And we can do one one mission or the other that will, you know, sabotage one, but you don't necessarily know which one's going to do which. Um, so, and, and so far, I've really tried to avoid the um, attacks on your home location because the base defense stuff is can be brutal if they throw the right, uh, enough stuff at you. Um, it's re I mean, it's, it's, like, it's really good. It's How about the story? How's the story in this game? Eh. Yeah, kind of like fine. the end of the prior game. Yeah, it's like, it's your standard sort of guerrilla warfare thing. And like, they, you know, they've, you've stolen a, a small 
uh, alien spaceship to like use as your home base so you can fly around the globe in it so it's like but it's all kind of the same equivalent of, of the base building of the first game uh, you know you, you're not because I was actually worried it's like oh well because I really like the base building in the last game and I was worried that like oh since we're kind of like a resistance cell is it going to be like you know, you don't get to do that. Is it not? But it's all it's all there. Yeah, that's one of the most rewarding parts of the last game to me. Yeah, and it's actually it's 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 I would say it's streamlined compared to the, the last one. Like just in the in the way it lets you you know go straight to build stuff from you know outfitting your your troops and like I think it's a lot easier to kind of uh, jump through the upgrade stuff and and it's it's just a little better in terms of how you have to interface with it. It it. it, it it's, I guess they learned how people prefer to interact with it. It's not as much, um, you know, go here, listen to this thing, pick this thing, now wait forever. You know, you know it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very much a sequel to the last game, uh, and they really tried to refine a lot of it. And I'm not a huge fan of all the time limit stuff, but there are also mods to, like, extend those time limits. From are you the, using those oh mods, yeah. Matt? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm a methodical turn-based strategy person. I don't, so I don't like I. to be rushed on those things. I don't so either. I, I mean, That's there, what I there like is about the genre. Is right. that it's something you can like kick back on the couch. It's like, I play those games watching TV on the couch a lot of times. Mm-hmm. TV show gets boring. Game gets boring. I'm watching. Back to the game. Play the game for a little bit. Something piques my interest on the TV. I can set it down. Mm-hmm. Watch whatever I'm watching for a little while. Come back and t- start the next turn. So... It is a little disconcerting. Obviously, can't play this on a handheld. Maybe someday. Um, hmm. So it is a little disconcerting to hear that maybe this game doesn't have that aesthetic. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not. You're not physically time limited. I mean, it's, just, it's not like you have a countdown clock for how long you have to move. It's just, you know, you got to do this thing in eight turns. And I have a mod that says, oh, actually, do it in twelve turns. Right. You know, right. It, there is a mod that removes time limits. Com- or, you know, the turn limits completely. But that feels like. like Going a that's too really far. cheating. <laughs> um, so this one just like it like extends it by like a third or half depending on the mission type, and it doesn't alter story missions at all. So, uh, and I find those to be because my main issue with the time the turn limit is that um, I've just run into too many procedurally generated missions that like don't seem to know they have a turn limit, right, you know, right. and it's like. And I just so some know. of the procedurally generated stuff isn't on the money, is what you're saying. I would say not, but which at the same, isn't a surprise. No, but at the same time, it's like, is that better or worse than like reusing the same maps over and over, like the last game? And it's kind of nice to not not know what I'm going into. For sure, yeah. yeah. So it sounds a lot like the last game. Yeah. And look, in my opinion, I love the last game. I really wouldn't want it to change all that much, to be perfectly honest with you. But there may be some people out there who tried the prior games and were like, it's not for me. Is there anything different enough about this game that may change their mind and maybe they'll get into this one? I wouldn't say so. No. Like, if you didn't like the last one, I don't see why you'd like this one. Um, unless you're a real, real big fan of underdog resistance gorilla stories. Yeah. Because like, <laughs> there, you know, there's, there, there's that. There's, you know, you're you're definitely the underdog. Now. You're not like a government-funded institution that's like, you know, f- you know, fighting back against, you know, outland invaders. Now you're like, you know, you're doing hit and run things, and that's kind of like the, I mean, the time limit, the turn limit thing is trying to evoke that feeling of like we got to go in, we got because the turn, you turn have to be limit, precise right. and, Well, yeah. the turn limit a lot, a lot of times is like the 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 in-universe justification is like, okay, now that we're here, they know we're here, and. We need to uh, do this and get out before their main force shows up. Right, right. So I mean that's reasonable. Um, oh, and the other thing uh, is uh, there's a thing in the game now called concealment, where you can uh, at the very beginning certain missions. Some missions you go in hot, but some missions, a lot of missions, you come in and they don't know you're there. Um, so you can sneak up, and as long as you don't wander into a line of sight, which is broken in some way, there's, there's like you'll see like red squares that you're, that's that's where they'll see you. Uh-huh. And sometimes you'll run up to an area near that where like it's clear, and then all of a sudden the red squares will expand out to where your character is, and they're like, oh, they saw you, because if one guy gets seen, your whole team loses concealment, right. unless you have special abilities that certain classes get. So, um, uh, so there, there is a thing with the concealment where if you do, if you play your cards right, you can set up some really, really nasty ambushes, uh, which is a lot of fun and very satisfying. And uh, I also sounds I, like some risk and reward. There's a lot of risk and reward. Yeah. Uh, I also really enjoy the uh, the ranger uh, is a new is is uh, 
has has uh, a lot of stuff you can do with her um, sort her melee move where you like if you, you can just dash up to someone and if you just click on the enemy she'll just run up and slice guys and then you and miss if you miss that's <laughs> bad but like right now that's know, the thing about this game right is like right. you can be occupying the space right next to an enemy your gun could literally be like clipping through oh, yeah. the enemy's head yeah, about 65% and then you'll miss. chance yeah. <laughs> to, to hit you know and it no. does it does you know the, the developers said they don't play at all with the random they say like if you have an eight percent chance it's an eight percent chance but people have dug into the uh code and found that like if it's over 50 percent like there's an adjustment that gets made if it's way low like 20 something percent you actually get a little bit of a bonus you know, yeah it does play in the favor of the player a little bit um which is probably fair considering how much extra stuff they've thrown against you in this yeah. one and the, and the longer injury turns and the, or injury rec- recuperation and stuff like that but um, you know, if you if you really if you like the last XCOM, there I don't know why you're watching this. Like, like why <laughs> you, you should, should be, be playing. playing XCOM too right now? I mean, there's no question. Um, and you know, and the community is already on top of you know a lot of different mods, a lot of cool stuff. Uh, there's some cool submachine gun mods that they do that like kind of combine the best of both worlds. Touch the multiplayer yet? No. Are you gonna? Probably not. Yeah. I don't I care, I don't care about turn based strategy multiplayer. That's not really a thing for me. Yeah, I didn't really enjoy it in the prior games either, to be honest with I you. I forgot it was in the prior game. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I totally forgot. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't enjoy it that much, the multiplayer. But no, you I mean, get so much out of the single player in this. It's yeah. kind of like a civilization game. Like, there are a few franchises that are a better buy or purchase. Yeah, this is a game I it was. More than happy to pay full price for, no question. And and, and you know it looks great. There's it like, looks know, amazing. Yeah, it really does. Lot, you know, and again, uh, I think one of the greatest things to happen to the turn-based strategy genre in forever is the ragdoll physics, um, which I think the first game I really played with that is a game called Silent Storm, which you can get on GOG.com these days, like and, and Steam I think. But that was a uh, it was like that's like a weird alternate universe World War Two game where like eventually you get like mech suits like steampunk mech, mech suits and stuff. Yeah. But like it was the first game of that genre I remember I played. It might have been the first game ever of that genre that had it. But it, it had like havoc physics, and so you could blow walls out, and like guys when they got killed would like fall off of like railings. And right. Like, right. And it was like you could you know if you like use a shotgun, the guy would fly over the railing and fall down, and if he landed on another guy, he'd do damage and stuff. It was so there was like a lot of like. You know, it just made killing things so much more visceral and exciting to like see them, For sure. you know, yeah. as opposed to just sort of you know the old style where they just sort of kneel down and vanish. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and like there was a real sense yeah. of deforming the battlefield with like explosives and stuff. And of course, XCOM does that very well. Already did it very well, and now yeah. I mean, you got you got giant monsters that'll swipe it. Buildings and rip the you know at one point he ripped the support column out of the building that my sniper was on and the sniper fell down like right in front of him and started to panic. That's like, awesome. Because she yeah. was like, "Oh my god, what is that?" And I'm just like, <laughs> "Yes, that is the thing that just destroyed the building you were on." So yeah, I can okay, I'll give you panic on that one. Go yeah. for it. So it's safe to assume that you wholeheartedly recommend this game to anyone who liked the prior games and even maybe people who just have an inkling for yeah, strategy if like, games. If you like turn-based strategy, I mean, it's not like that genre is you know blowing up right now. Yeah. Uh, but this is certainly one of the best options around. Uh, you know, go go pick this pick this one up and pick Valkyria Chronicles up and you're good. You'll be well, if you pick this up, you'll be good for the next like two months. So. Yeah, I think this will take care of you for quite some time. It's a it's a you get your sixty bucks worth. All right, on. All right, let's move on to the next topic of the big six. We are talking about Titanfall Two, or whatever it ends up being called. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So let's talk about the first Titanfall first. Mm-hmm. I think we were, you know, considering respawn was, you know, the name. It's named that for a reason. It right. was a respawn of people who worked at Infinity Ward on Call of Duty. I think we all expected Titanfall to have a campaign, and Ooh. in fact. It technically does. Sort of. When you boot up the game, there's a campaign option there. Right. And but you, you really, listen to a bunch of audio files of characters that I don't remember. Right. Really, it's just like a training mode for right. the most part. Like, it teaches you how to play online. So it was announced... And it's still multiplayer. Like, it's still, you know... The, the, it is, yeah. <laughs> you're still playing multiplayer. It's just like people are yelling in your ear all the time about it. Yeah. And so this week, it was confirmed slash announced that Titanfall 2 will, in fact, have a single-player component to it. Hopefully more robust than the... And hopefully mm-hmm. they're not pulling the old switcheroo on us here, and they're like, well, we already had a campaign in our first one. But... So here's the thing. Is this universe... Well, first of all, let's talk about this. 
the fact that Titanfall is bucking the trend, Titanfall 2, because mm -hmm. most shooters coming out these days are leaving the campaign out of the equation. So Rainbow Six Siege is probably the most glaring one, mm -hmm. or Star Wars Battlefront. There's another one didn't really have a single-player campaign. So the first game didn't have one. This is having it. Do you think this universe is ripe for a campaign, Matt? Oh, yeah. No question. Like, there's, there's tons of stuff happening in the backgrounds of these maps where you're like, what is that? What yeah. are those dragons? Like, what is going on? You know, like, the, the, the ruins of some of this stuff. Like, I really want to know what's happening here. You know, it was, it'd be like playing Gears of War with no single player, where you're just like, wow, this is a really interesting world we're on, a really interesting universe. I wish I knew more about it. You know? It is kind of crazy that when you think about it, that in the first game, they do kind of have those hints of something bigger, yeah. something else going on. Mm -hmm. So maybe they knew all along in the I sequel. Think there was a, I think there was going to be a campaign at some point, and there was a point where you just decide, you know, they're a new company, they're, they're on a you know, next-gen platform, they're you know, learning the ropes on a bunch of different things. you got to focus on your strength, and that's multiplayer. For, you know, Call of Duty, make or, make or break in Call of Duty is multiplayer, make or break on their new game is going to be multiplayer. So I think that's where they went with it, and it made sense to me. I, I miss the campaign because I love campaigns. Yeah, first game was only on one platform initially. Mm -hmm. It was basically just for, for the Xbox brand. They didn't make a PlayStation version of the game. Mm -hmm. um, it was a PC. And right. Origin. Mike Microsoft which brand. Not, uh, yeah. <laughs> which, was, which was not... Um, I, wonder, I wonder how much Origin helps or hurts things in that case. Because a lot of times I forget I have Origin on my computer. Yeah. Well, it doesn't forget <laughs> you have it on the computer. <laughs> so, I, I don't know, though. It's like... The lore of this, I didn't get that much from it. There weren't a lot of vocal samples. There weren't a lot of character interaction, like other than Prepare for Titanfall, who was, mm -hmm. which was voiced by one of our friends. Yeah. And also, and maybe in the case of full disclosure, we should mention that we're good friends with somebody who works mm -hmm. on Titanfall, Abby Heppy, who worked with us both at G4. More, you more than me. Yeah. She kind of came on late, right before I left, and then she stayed there for several years, and then oh, yeah. moved on to respawn. So we are good friends with somebody who works on this game, just to kind of keep it on the up and up with our discussion here. Um, but I don't know. I didn't. I don't know that I felt like there was like a real universe there when I played that game. Like. I felt like there could have been. I mean, clearly there was thought put into how. I mean, look, it's giant worked. mechs. Like, right. <laughs> write your own story, but. But clearly, there's something going. You know, the, the, the two different sides are very different in the in the way they're presented and the way their technology seems to work. You know, there's, you know, I don't really understand what the re rebellion group, the insurrection insurgent group, is like angry about. Um, I don't. You know, so like, I think there's room for a story to be told there. Because there weren't any really characters, is what I'm saying. Like, no. they never really introduced even a cast of people that you could kind of relate to and latch on to and hope to maybe learn more about in the sequel. They were all, well, it was all done through like audio dialogue that's happening while you're playing a multiplayer match. Right, so like yeah. it's really not the best time <laughs> to try to get me to pay attention to the lore when I'm like, you know, trying to kill like 420 uh, XX, you know, blade 69. blade warrior <laughs> whatever. Um, and it's it, it was I it was a, I appreciate the effort, but it didn't really get me anywhere in in this world. And I don't really yeah. I, I don't understand the politics of it. I don't understand who's fighting who for what. All I know is uh, you know, the guy in the green mech is bad cuz I'm in the white mech. Right. You know, like that's it. Um, so I think there's plenty of room for that. And I know, you know, if you look at the way they've designed a lot of those locations, like there's there's clearly someone has an idea of what's going on behind the scenes on these yeah. on these this world. So well, you think uh, they would have created like a franchise bible or something? Yeah. Well, some I wouldn't be surprised. If, play by. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if like we saw you know it would make sense to do like comic books or something. Gears of War did the same thing. They yeah. did, you know, did a, a very large comic book. Thing. Assassin's Creed is done. I think I think yeah. comics is a good almost place. every big game has yeah. a comic now. I think it's good. Like, it's a good place them. to kind of expand the lore it if you is, really yeah. want. Because because again, you know, I know they mentioned something about a TV show, but it's like this as a TV show, like you're, that's a multi million dollar per episode oh, thing. Yeah, if you got easily. these giant robots running around, for sure. And otherwise, you're just like you got everybody. You know, it's going to look like a bunch of Battlestar Galactica cosplayers like sitting around talking. Like, it's yeah. like you know, you got to. Deliver, and I think comics are the best way to deliver that because you don't have to pay to draw a giant mech anymore. Yeah. You have to pay to draw anything pay else. Pay the artist yeah. the same thing no yeah. matter what. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. let's, let's go talk about the first game. Now, obviously, it was kind of a pioneer because it kind of created this new way to traverse games while you play a first-person shooter. Mm -hmm. And now we've seen Call of Duty kind of follow up. You know, it had wall running, and now yeah. every Call of Duty has wall running. And, after, you know, Call of Duty took a step back a little bit with Black Ops 3 this year. It didn't give you the same traversal mechanics that the game prior did. 
But we're all kind of we're kind of seeing all these games now kind of moving in this direction. Where would you like to see Titanfall 2 go? Do you want it to go farther? Um, I would. I'd like to see um, more verticality. I I I mean they did do some some really impressive vertical maps, but I love to see like I love to see a, ma- a map that takes place entirely between skyscrapers. Yeah. Like, no ground. I mean, the thing you have to keep in mind is you have to also work the mechs into it. And the one thing I... Well, that's why the mechs need to be able to fly. Right. (laughs) Well, the thing that I thought was really cool about the first Titanfall, and I didn't even realize it when I first started playing it, but as you start playing, you start to realize that the buildings serve as, like, the cover for Mm -hmm. the mechs. And once you realize that, you start looking around, and you really start to understand the level design in the game. Mm -hmm. How there's, like two levels to the level design. There's a level for when you're on foot, and then there's a level for when you're a mech. And so I found that really interesting how they had built all those maps. So what about like a cover system for the mechs? That would be interesting to cover, like, or even just like a, a particular type of mech that can take cover. Right. You know, yeah, that would, that like would be something. Like one class or something. Yeah, that would be interesting to see. And I would also, again, I will always advocate transforming mechs. Yeah. So something that can... <laughs> to, Hard to, to argue against that. Just to expand kind of, you know, in, you know maybe, maybe that's pushing it a little too far in a battlefield territory. But I'd love to see uh, like a classic can turn into a flying vehicle. Yeah. I'd love to see something can turn into a ground vehicle with like some speed on it. Um, maybe lightly armed but speedy. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what you're doing. Why, you know, why is that useful? I don't know. Like, you know, it would have to depend on the type of, of match. But um, I'd like to see. I'd like just like to see it get bigger. You know, the maps are already pretty good size. Yeah, yeah. And well, like, they have to be when you're. Yeah. We have robots of this size. And they did a really good job of kind of doing the macro versus the micro, and the and the you know the the, the agility of the of the pilots really let you like c- cross those giant maps right quickly. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think that's a you know like the battlefield problem of like oh I spawned all the way back here now I gotta like everybody else took the jeep so I gotta run all I the way mean, back. I mean, look, I did find myself doing a good bit of running in this game. Mm-hmm. And that was one thing I think I would like to see them tweak a little bit, is the ability to get the mechs more often. Like, Mm -hmm. I just felt like that wasn't balanced very well. Like, there's a lot of first-person shooters out there that let you run, and granted, they did have, like, the wall running kind of first. I mean, you know, you can go all the way back to Star Siege Tribes if you really Mm -hmm. want to talk about the game that really started with, you know, expanding traversal in a first-person shooter. But, you know, recently, this was kind of, like, the landmark game Mm -hmm. that brought it to the fore. So I do appreciate it for that, but... I played the game to fight in the mechs, and I felt like a lot of times, like, either it took too long to get the mechs, or once I got it, it was destroyed way too easily. Like, Mm -hmm. it never felt like I had enough time doing what I really wanted to do in the game, I Mm -hmm. guess is the best way to put it, which is controlling the mechs and fighting other people in mechs, so... I would be interested to see, like, the mechs become tougher and, you know, harder for other mechs to really take down, but I'd like to see them expand... The ability of the pilots to do something to the mechs, like well, it did kind of have that mechanic where you could just you could run jump up on and, top yeah. of them and kind of do that thing. But I like to see something where like that really like takes advantage of the fact that when you're in the mech, like your size means you're not entirely aware of what's happening on the ground. Um, because like like say like give them like a particular class of soldier could have like a grappling hook kind of thing mm-hmm. instead of a, instead of a jetpack, yeah, yeah. but they can use that grappling hook to kind of like you know like. Just cause style, like create like kind of an ad yeah, yeah. trip situation right, right. for the mech. But then, like you know, the the mechs are so important to like your side winning that it you know it, it's on the in the best interest of the other pilots that are not in mechs to stop the enemy pilots from being able to set those traps up. For I them. really like the idea of traps. Yeah, I think that would be awesome. Yeah, like being able to set up traps for the mechs. It doesn't have to be complicated. Like literally, just hold a button to set the trap mm-hmm. or whatever. But I think that would add a, add a really, really cool element yeah. to the game. And, like, you know, they can be visible to the mech. If the mech sees it far enough out, like, it's like, okay. There's a, but that closes off a route. You yeah. Know, that, that can allow you to sort of control the battlefield. And, you know, and you have to... Maybe, maybe mechs can, can't disarm traps. Only pi- other pilots can come disarm that trap. Right, So right. you have to, you know... So it kind of creates a more, in, you know... That's a really important element of armored warfare is you need the infantry, you know... You know, shepherding the tanks. You know, tanks can't operate without infantry, effectively, because there there are too many blind spots. So, right. like to kind of make you feel a little more important as a pilot, I think that would be a, a good direction to take it. How long did you play the first Titanfall? Because I honestly played it probably a month and a half before I stopped mm, playing. I don't remember how like month wise, but I, I mean, it wasn't like another Call of Duty for me. Like, no, I, it wasn't I played one of those games until that I just played all year long. But I played I had until some level time. like max level, level fifty or around there, and I did not prestige. Yeah, um, and that was that. You know, which is like, why do you think it doesn't have the staying power of like a Call of Duty or even maybe a Halo? 
Well, for me, it was just that like all my friends didn't play it long enough. Yeah, you know, like people. That's always a big part of it. Yeah, people played it for a while, and then that was that was kind of that, you know. And uh, also, the other thing is like you know, at least at the time, you know, one of the things that used to, I used to play shooters a lot with. I used to play shooters a lot uh, with Abby. Right. And, oh, there you go. Yeah. And uh, I actually know. played this Titanfall with her a yeah. lot. Yeah. I would play with her and some of the you know, and she would usually have guys you know from uh, respawn with her. And uh, there's nothing more uh, disheartening <laughs> than playing a shooter with people who made that shooter. Well, the other thing, too, is that Abby is good at shooters. Oh, Abby is probably the best shooter player I know. She and I would hang out at the Call of Duty review events, and we would mm-hmm. hang out for lunch, dinner, blah, 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 and then we'd play next to each other at the kiosk that they had set up. So I'd play, like, right now, mm-hmm. and, like, she was every bit as good as I was oh, at yeah. Call of Duty. I mean, and so... We played, uh, we did all the... the you know, the co-op stuff, the spec ops stuff yeah. for um, uh, Modern Warfare 2 together. And, like, that was basically, like, uh, I was the backup. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, it's like okay, like, yeah, yeah, I'm like, you yeah. know, she'll run out and do crazy shit to stop the juggernauts, and I'll just, like, kill the soldiers coming up behind. Like, that's And, it. look, those are the type of people you want oh, developing yeah. first-person shooters, people who get what the high level of play is, is all about. So... I think we're both excited. I'm, we're going to get a look at this at mm-hmm. E3. I mean, it's going to sure. be a big coming out party. You see that McFarlane thing? That wasn't. I think that just popped like right before I came over here. No, actually, huh. McFarlane announced that like they have uh, new um, Titanfall figures they're going to make, oh. and they said they said they're sh- you know Titanfall figures shipping winter 2016 alongside Titanfall 2. And people Wait are like, a minute. people are like, uh, no, that that's seems right. too soon. That's not right. Yeah. Uh, that was just a misprint. It had to be. So it well, was a pro- I assume well, it was EA an action figures company week. not understanding when things launch. EA announced last week that worst case scenario, if it doesn't get delayed, worst case scenario is like March of 2017. Mm-hmm. So we should have it within about a year. Also, technically, that's still winter. It well, that so. would be winter 2017, though, not 2016. Yeah. But it's McFarlane toys. What do they know? <laughs> Apparently, they don't know anything. <laughs> so it's been twenty years. They still make statues instead of action figures. Yeah, so. yeah, you're right. Yeah. They all smell weird. Yeah, I actually kind of like the smell of this thing. Yeah, but... well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's nice to open. You open an action figure, you get a little high, <laughs> and you have an action figure. <laughs> what is that called when people sniff action figures? There's huffing? a word. For, huff, is, well, I think, huffing action I think there's some other word for it. I'm sure someone. I'm, sh- in, I'm sure there's some word. For someone it, in yeah. chat, I'm sure, will tell us what it is. But uh, I'm not, excited. If they're for not too busy too. doing it. I mean, if that was their... Exactly. <laughs> I mean, if that was their first effort, that was a great first effort. Like, yeah. I mean, the lack of a campaign was disappointing, but, I mean, look, for a brand new studio to make a game like that, that was pretty mm-hmm. good. And now they've had a few years here to work on the sequel. I think it could end up being something really special. So, yeah. And you got to figure they are, you know, they probably had more ideas than you can imagine on the cutting room floor oh, for just sure. for the first game. Yeah, so every team yeah. is like that with yeah. any game they make. So. And this one, I mean, you're, you know, you're really trying to shift a paradigm with that. I think they did, in a lot, yeah. you know, judging by the influence it's yeah. had on Call of Duty in particular. Yeah. So uh, I'm looking forward to what they do next. Mm. Yeah, looking forward to E3 to check that out for the first time. All right, let's mm-hmm. move on to the next topic. We're going to talk about... An indie game that when it was announced at E3 last year, I think most people thought it was going to be the game of the forever. It melted everyone's eat cold, stone cold E3 hearts. And that game was Unravel. Mm. And so it's about this little guy made out of yarn, and the gameplay mechanics are built around the fact that he's made out of yarn. You need to use the yarn that he's made of to help navigate the uh, environment. It's a side-scrolling platformer. Um, Matt, have you played Unravel at all? I have not. All right, so I have, and I look. I was equally excited. I don't know if you remember too the whole presentation the guy ha- gave. He was so nervous, he was visibly shaking on oh, camera. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Remember that? And uh, so it was like the darling of E3 last year. Everyone was rooting for it, and so was I. Like I love de- developers like that that wear their heart on their sleeve, and you can really see that they poured their heart and soul into their games. Um, everybody's been rooting for this game, but Matt, now that I've played it. I, ha- I seriously think this might be the most disappointing game for me of 2016. Wow. I uh, really disappointed in this game. Look, the charm is all there. Um, the, it's like a silent story. You're kind of seeing the story mm-hmm. set up right here, and that's really pretty much all you get <laughs> of a the story in the game. Um, but my problem is uh, the aesthetics are fine. Yarny's adorable. I love the setup of it. I love the story for the game. It's just the gameplay is... It starts out great. For the first hour I played this game, I was like, it's exactly what I thought it was going to be and even better than what I thought it was going to be. And then after that first hour, you start to realize that like this whole game 
was just built on the aesthetic and they didn't actually think about how everything was going to work in practice because you'd think about the fact that okay you're this unraveling character mm -hmm. you would just think the the gameplay possibilities the level design possibilities would just be limitless and endless for something like this and maybe in the hands of another developer it might be but in the case of this game i felt like after i played the first hour of the game i had seen pretty much everything the game had to offer i just it never expanded on like any of the gameplay mechanics. So after you play the first hour of it, even the second hour is like forgiving. I was like, because mm -hmm. I really wanted to like this game so bad. But it just, it's the same thing the over. Top notch page flipper yeah. simulator. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And look, I'm a gameplay first guy. I've said that ever since I was in this industry. I say it today. To me, what matters the most to me is how a game actually plays. And a mm -hmm. big part of that is that typically video game stories are pretty stupid. In fact, they're almost always stupid, especially when compared to a book or a film. So I try not to put my eggs in, in that basket. Instead, I enjoy more about how a game plays, and that's really how I get into video games. So for this game to fall on its face in this regard was a huge disappointment to me. There's like... The, honestly, the fact that the gameplay is repetitive wouldn't bother me as much if it was consistent. This game breaks fundamental game design rules of your character should jump the same distance every time. Mm. When you use the yarn, it should work the same every time. But what this game does is it fudges it. Like, when you see a jump after you've played a platformer for a while, you know immediately. It's some weird innate thing that you have in your brain that you can tell whether you can make that jump or not. Like, even in, like, 3D Mario games, Mario 64 or Mario Sunshine or whatever, like, even with the long jump, after you've played it for a little while, you know exactly whether that long jump is going to get you over that gap. And in this game, it is a guessing game the whole way through. Like, you'll see gaps, and you will be trained to say, okay, the jump cannot make this gap. And so you start investigating like every other way to get through this part this section of the game and eventually you're just like okay this isn't working i'll just try to make the jump and you'll make the jump because it will like give you an extra boost on your jump just for that particular part of like the level like hmm. i've never played a game like this matt where i know a game that reminds me of what little big planet really because I, I, like I thought it was consistent in little big planet but it was just really floaty yeah, but like I found like, you know, your jumps in Little Big Planet, I, it doesn't seem like it's the same case here, but like the the jumps in Little Big Planet um seem to depend very much on what the platform you're on was doing. Yeah. And it wasn't consistent in the sense that like, you know, there's momentum in Mario, but like Mario's jump will always pretty much behave the same way and I didn't get you know Sometimes these modern platformers can get a little too wrapped up in their own physics right. versus like making sure that your gameplay experience is consistent. And I, I got that feeling... Actually, what you're saying here doesn't surprise me at all because I got that feeling watching this at E3. Really? That I, th I thought that was going to be the kind of thing. I was like, well, that's not for me. I, I, I never really had any interest in this game. But yeah, I mean, I would probably really? buy... Really? You had no interest in it at no. all? I would probably buy like a like a, a stuffed version of, of the character yeah because he's adorable well they uh, showed you actually they put out a trailer that showed you how to make your own oh, yarny yeah. and uh <laughs> and it's beautiful I mean it looks yeah, great it's but like, it is a gorgeous game there's no denying it and the physics of the way the yarn works is great mm -hmm. but again it's like it's like a five trick pony right. I guess is the best that's way a, to play I mean that's just was exactly my impression of it uh when I saw it and like yeah, well, maybe I mean probably get it one day if it's like free for PlayStation Plus or like it's cheap on something. I'll, I'll probably get it and play it then. But uh, it was never on my priority list. What you're saying, what you're saying here is just like I, I'm. You can't see me because the B rolls up, but I'm just I'm just nodding. Yeah. Like, yep. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, here's the not thing. to disparage the the developer or the or the poor shaky guy on the stage or anything. Like, you know, like. It's just, I saw what I saw, and I know that that kind of thing is not for me. And look, here's the thing about disappointment. It's, uh, there's an equation there where you multiply, like, your hype level <clears throat> times, like, final product mm -hmm. equals disappointment level. So the game's not terrible by any stretch of the imagination. There'll be a lot of games that are released this year that are far worse than this one. It's just that I was so excited for this game and anxious mm -hmm. to play it that what I ultimately got out of it was disappointing. So I think it sells for 20 bucks. I mean, I would honestly wait until you can get it for around 10 And I and to be honest with you, that's only for the people who were like me, who were really jacked up for this game. And 
I don't know. I thought it was going to be one of those games that like made me tear up. Like I just mm. and it just never. It doesn't even really get there with the story either because it's like a silent thing. Like you, it's hard to build a much of an attachment to what's going on. Um, yeah, but there's. I mean, Ori in the Blind Forest pulls that off. Yeah, very well. Very well. So, yeah, yeah. You're right. It's not. You know. It's a good point. Yeah. So. I don't know. Disappointed in this game. Um, I'd be interested to hear if you know other sifters have been disappointed with it as well. Um, it's certainly not what I expected it to be. Although in some ways it is. It's another side-scrolling indie platformer mm. with a gimmick. <laughs> so I don't know. People seem to be kind of like, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, they're like, yeah. I, people, I'm playing it. I agree with it. I agree with Shane, but I'm still having fun with it. It's fine. You know, yeah. It's look. Like, I enjoyed it. I played and it. A lot, the end. a lot of people that are worried what you're going to think of Cuphead. No, oh. <laughs> well, Cuphead's a whole other beast. Yeah, that's more along the lines of like a Bloodborne, Dark Souls thing, where like how how much does the game punish you right. versus how much does it reward right. you? Um, and it will be interesting to play Cuphead. I mean, I did play it at E3 briefly, and it was it was one of those games where like I played it on the show floor. It wasn't like a private event where you have like time. There's mm-hmm. like people waiting behind you to play, and so. I think I played it for like five minutes and I was like, this isn't an E3 game. Like, you need to concentrate. Like, you need to be in the zone. You need to have played it for a while. And I was really surprised too, because you know at E3, a lot of times they like nerf demos for games. Mm -hmm. Like, they'll make it a lot easier so that people who play it at E3 don't get frustrated. And, you know, you have that five minute, 10 minute chunk of time that you have to play the game. So a lot of times they nerf games for their E3 demos. And they didn't do that with Cuphead at all, which in some ways I appreciate because. It's not, you know, when you change your game for E3, you're kind of duping people a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like that they stuck to their guns, but it just did not, it doesn't provide the conducive environment for that game at E3. So, but you're right. Cuphead is a big, big X factor for me right now. (laughs) Like, I love everything about that game. It looks incredible. Some of the best animation I've ever seen in a game. Uh, But man, I just, yeah, it's a hard, even at E3, it was like really like ball to the wall hard. So we'll see how that one turns out. But, uh. You know, I already I did draft it in my fantasy. Yeah. Fantasy. Yeah. I have a feeling that people are going to really like it. I also have a feeling I'm going to really like it. I mean, those guys. Hopefully, they'll be a little smart about it. And we'll just Ho- make. Hopefully, it like... they, the reviewers that are that's given to are the uh, are the hardest of the hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll see. I can see some frustrated sevens. Yeah, on yeah that, that one. could happen. I mean, it doesn't happen really to Bloodborne and Dark Souls though. No, but Bloodborne and Dark Souls kind of have that rep. So yeah. like they've, I think you, I think everybody's got their Dark Souls guy on their review crew. Yeah. Whereas like. Cuphead, like I think you know, you could give it to the animation fan, and the animation fan might not have the uh, or the indie guy, old school, the skills. guy who reviews all your indie games yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. like you, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how people react to it. You know, side scrolling platformers have become difficult yeah. though. In I the mean, last but, yeah, I mean, people, you five, know, six years. I think you know, if if you give it to the guy on your team who really likes Super Meat Boy, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, they'll, it'll, they'll probably be able to handle Plus or yeah. any of those games. That, I mean, that's that is the one thing I would say about side-scrolling platformers over the last seven or eight years, is that they've really ratcheted up the difficulty in a lot of them. Yeah, a lot of children of the NES. Uh, yeah, <laughs> putting out these. I'd like things. to see real children today play some of these games, though. I don't we, think they make. We it played too some hard games back in the day. We sure did. I had a couple of games on my Apple IIe that I didn't figure out for years. <laughs> And now it's too late. It's hard to go back to games like yeah, that. Yeah, I wouldn't now. want to go back to Conan on the Apple II. I don't know. I don't think I could do it. That game was like six levels long, and it took me like a year. To and you get can through. find your cassette tape that you plug into it to play. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Let's talk about Hitman. 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 Hitman has a beta starting next mm-hmm. week. Um, there's information on Sifted on how to get into the beta. If you guys want, just go to the Hitman game page. And then click early access in the channel nav, and it'll sift it all out for you and show you how to get on the beta. Um, but big, big stories coming out today. Tons of previews came out for this. There was a press event a couple weeks ago. The embargo broke today. Um, for the most part, people are glowing over this game, Matt. Like almost all the previews were unanimously mm-hmm. positive. There Which was is impressive considering the rocky road getting here. Yeah, because most people have been down on this game for a while. I think I've kind of been down on it a little bit, to be honest with you. Um, the only negative preview that I saw was from RPS, Rock Paper Shotgun. Um, they dug into it pretty good, and and I'm not going to just paraphrase mm-hmm. everything that they said, but if, again, that's on Sifted as well if you want to read RPS tends to be a pretty sober site. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm surprised that RPS... Offers so much opinion in his previews and still gets invited still gets to, to go events. to the previews. Yeah, yeah. I admire um, him for it. That's brave because I know what happens yeah. when you do that is you have to answer hard questions the next time you go to an event. They're mm-hmm. like, wait a minute, you know, it's supposed to be preview coverage. 
but if you just report on what's there, you know, the game's not finished, blah, blah, blah. They do, all their previews are like that, which is one of the reasons we curate so much of their content, because they will actually give you the scoop on a game from a preview event instead of just saying it's all rainbows and unicorns, like a lot of publications do. If you like Hitman, you're going to love Hitman. Yeah, you know, like, exactly. Like... <laughs> <laughs> and look, there were a lot of rainbows and unicorns flying out of people's asses on these previews. Right. Like, and ba- you know, reading some of the previews, I can understand why. Like, it, it looks like finally, you know, the last game was kind of linear. Like, they would say, oh, well, there's like two or three different ways to accomplish this contract, but you still had to complete the contracts basically in the same order. Mm. This game, it, 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 it just happens on the fly. Like, you'll be in the middle of a mission, and, like, a character will walk up to you, and all of a sudden, you're sent off on, like, a side mission. And each one of these missions has multiple ways to solve it. Um, I think there was one mission that people were writing about, about how you, you walk past a girl, she's like, you look like blah, 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 who's, like, this, this model or whatever. And uh, so what you can do is you can, like, you can go and, like, knock out the model and take as close as... He, Conveniently enough, the model's bald, so <laughs> you can take his clothes, right? Around. Yeah, you can take his clothes and put them on, and you can like go through like hair and makeup, and like go through <laughs> the whole process of being him, or you can just immediately be him and try to accomplish the mission that you're trying to accomplish before. So it sounds like the game really splinters off in a bunch of different directions, completely unexpectedly, and there's a lot of latitude in how you accomplish things. So to me, that's getting Hitman back to a place where I would enjoy it. Mm-hmm. What's your impression of Hitman? We've talked on the show before that both of us have maybe burned out on it a little bit over the years. Yeah, I mean, I've never. There's never been a Hitman I really got into all that much. I think Contracts and Blood Money were the closest I came. Mainly Contracts because it, it had variety to it. But, like, you know, I remember trying to play the first one, uh, which, if you haven't played the first Hitman in a while, uh, go, pick the, go play that on Steam. And, yeah. uh, wow, that is a bad inventory in, in, interface. Yeah. That's amazing. So they've really, you know, brought it up to speed in recent years. And I like Absolution okay. But, like, part of my thing is, like, where Hitman can go wrong is when it feels like there's a way you're supposed to do it. And I think a lot of the recent games have had that no, to yeah. them. Well, there is a thing. You would try to find another way to do it, and you beat your head against a wall, like, ten times in a row, and just be like, screw it. I'm just going to mm. do what the game wants me to do. Yeah. And it, like... I feel like it discouraged experimentation. Not agree. And yeah. Hopefully, I haven't played this one. I'm, I wasn't at the preview event, but like, hopefully, this one is a little less like that. I, you know, it's, it's like I don't like that whole idea of like where you're like, oh, you can do approach things every want because I, that annoys me in like Assassin's Creed too, where they they've, they've had like the optional objectives for like since like Brotherhood or whatever, where it's like, yeah. oh, you can do these assassinations however you want, but here's how you really should do them, and like I hate that. And yeah. Like, Hitman, of all games, should not have that, anything like that in it. And I think, you know, even Absolution had a little bit of, like, you know... I think they're trying to encourage replay value, but it always just felt to me like you're trying to, like, make me jump through hoops. Yeah. Like, oh, do it this way, and do you can do it this way, do this way. It's like, yeah, but, like... Some of the ways are so get... freaking hard, yeah. and you have to rely on so much luck. And a lot of the really hard ways in, like, Absolution, I didn't feel paid off well enough. Because, right. like, yeah. there's, like, you know, there's some really hard ways. Like, I remember, like, one mission in... I can't remember which one it was, but it was like basically the payoff was the way you like ri- you rigged up an outdoor like you know glass bottom hot tub to basically blow like above like you know it was like a Hollywood mansion kind of thing so the yeah. the hot tub's out above nothing like you know like above on a mountain and like you rig it to basically break when the target's in it and like you you get this like great payoff where like the guy drops out of a hot tub and falls to his death like that and like I didn't feel you know it's very it was. I remember that being pretty challenging to set up because a bunch of different ways you had to deal and the timing had to be right and you had to do all this stuff. But, like, you got a really cool kill out of it. And, like, yeah. in Absolution, I felt like a lot of the hardest things to set up were, like, not really worth my time in doing that. I felt like there were cooler ways to do it that were less difficult. And so I'm hoping that there's a kind of a more of a balance to that now. Here's what I would say about the episodic part of this game. I think, in my personal opinion, that that could be the very best way to play this game because... Mm-hmm. One thing I find about these games is, like, I, I complete a mission, and I almost get, like, a sense of relief from yeah. it. It's yeah. not one of those games where I complete a mission, and I'm like, I can't wait for the next one. It's like, thank God I got through <laughs> that finally. Oh, my God. Like, the guy didn't see me when I was walking out this time, and I didn't fail. Like, I think it might be perfect for an episodic mm-hmm. Type structure. Well, I'm also interested in, in you know, if the episodic structure lets them react to how players are playing the game more effectively. 
like that could, you know, you know, maybe two episodes down the road, if you know people are doing a certain thing a certain way in episode one, maybe episode three takes that idea and really like twists it and capitalizes on it. Like that could, you, you know, once that whole thing's done and out, you could end up with a much better game than if they put it out all at once. You're right. They can take user feedback into account to shape the entirety of the game because look, there's only so much they can do in a patch, mm-hmm. and usually. When they patch something, it's like, oh, we're going to lower the hit points of this guy, or we're going to change the way he, this AI reacts to something that happens. Like the, the tweaks that you can make are fairly minimal to a game once it's been created in full. Because the other part of it, too, is that like sometimes with games, it's like dominoes. Mm-hmm. Like you change one little thing. It's like the butterfly effect. Like butterfly flaps its wings off the coast of Australia, and it causes a tornado in <laughs> Tennessee or whatever. It's... That's how it works with games sometimes. They like it, It's a block that will topple other blocks on down the line in your game design. So I agree. Like I also feel like it could help the game's design. It could certainly help with just tuning and things mm-hmm. like that. It could also find exploits and make sure that people aren't abusing like the same thing over and over. Um, I just think it. This I think Square Enix has made the right choice here with this franchise being the one that they decide to send episodic. And look, I realize Final Fantasy, Square Enix is on the episodic kick. Right. Um, and a lot of people are afraid that all their games are going to become episodic, but I think this is one case mm-hmm. where they made the right choice. I think you can also see the, the hooks of an episodic sort of idea in Rise of the Tomb Raider yeah, as well. Yeah, for sure. Like, I'm, I, wonder how much of, I wonder how much of that game being one game came from the fact that it had to be the timed exclusive on the Xbox One, and they had to get that thing done and out in a, in a unit. Also surprised how quickly the other versions of that game are coming. Yeah, that was quite a turnaround. That's pretty dirty. Yeah. Because, look, I'm... Look, Xbox One didn't sell 10 million copies because it had the exclusive on Tomb Raider. But I'm sure it sold a few. There's some people out there who Mm. got an Xbox One because they're like, I want to play Rise of the Tomb Raider. I'm assuming... I'm only going to be able to play it on Xbox One for a year. I think that's what most people assume. Six months to a year, I would... Yeah. yeah. And it ended up being like a A month. month. Before the PC version, it's like came if you out. got that for Christmas, it's just like, well, should have waited four weeks, bro. Also, like, I mean, yeah, if you have like a decent rig, like most people would have preferred to just wait and buy the PC version. Like that's I some, would have. That's some dirty pool, man. Like, yeah. That's and now I don't stuff. know what to do because I re- I really like that game, but I'm like, oh, if I play it again, I kind of like to play the PC version. Right. But I want to buy it again. No, no, I'm not, so. I would not buy it again. It's not good enough to buy it again anyway. So I don't know if I would play it again to be honest with you. I feel like I got kind of my fill. From... I'll probably play it. Again. I played the the the, the you know the preview the reboot before I played I played that twice. Where do you I find all this it. time, Kyle? <laughs> you gotta I make do time. You must not sleep because I sleep like four hours a night, and I just don't have the time to play as many games as you. Yeah, who needs sleep? <laughs> Nobody needs that. Sleep is for the dead. Sifted. That's what <laughs> I like to say. That's what I've been living on for the last uh, year and a half. So, I think this is a really auspicious uh, set of previews for Hitman. It definitely reinvigorated my interest in mm. the game. Um, again, you know, a, a lot of things that, p- that people were saying made it seem like episodic is the right way to go. Just looking at how I've played this game in the past and how I've, it's kind of affected me in the past, I think it's the right call. Um, there was a time I was really down on this game, so anytime the tide starts turning for me on a game, I want to make sure I mention it. I just don't want to leave people thinking that I'm not into it. So I'm excited for Hitman now. And yeah. there's a beta next week. I think it com- the first episode comes out in March, I believe. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. So we won't have, have to wait too long. Some of you guys will be playing it next week. Um, everybody will be playing it in just a month and a half or something like that. So good stuff, Hitman. Well, let's move on. We're going to talk about another indie game. Another indie darling, kind of. At least it's one of those games that's been getting a lot of, a lot of uh, positive press leading mm-hmm. up to its release. And that game is Firewatch. It's a first-person Wandering Wanderer. simulation, and I've got to say, I usually hate walking simulators. I don't generally like any of them. I, I don't. There's some that have been they've received huge reviews that I played for like an hour, and I was like, I want no part of this. I'm not into it. Um, this game got me. It it, is, <clears throat> it has got me. I've not finished it yet. Um, I'm about three hours in, and you want to know it really sets this off for me. It's all about the relationship between you, the walkie-talkie, and the girl back at base. The writing, the voice acting, everything for this is what sets this game off and separates it because it it humanizes everything. Mm. Cuz like you're this guy who's trying to get away from it all. You take this job out in the middle of the wilderness and you think you're going to be left alone. And so there's that whole part of the game where he's trying to 
make it work, I guess is the best way to put it. Because it's like, this isn't really what he signed up for. He has this like chatty person on his radio. Hmm. He thought he was going to go out and be able to get away from it all and just have this solitary job where he's not bothered by anybody. So at first, it almost comes off like it's kind of intrusive on his plans. Mm -hmm. And so it's very interesting to watch him kind of slowly warm up to this person who's on the other end of the walkie-talkie. There's the mystery of, like, who is this person? Or do they really even work for? Because it gets, like, personal. Like, they start building this personal relationship with each other. And they start having conversations about things that aren't related to work. And uh, so you wonder the whole time, like, you know, is this person really working for, like, the Forest Service? Or is it just someone who's, like, hijacked the signal on a walkie-talkie and they're messing with you? Like... I'm really enjoying it. And I love the setting. The visuals are absolutely gorgeous. Like, they uh, they have this thing where you can snap photos in the game with, like, an instamatic camera. And now you can actually have those photos, like, printed out in real life, <laughs> which is crazy. Like, I don't know if too many people are going to want real photos of fake things. It's pretty bizarre. I mean, they did it with uh, Gran Turismo. Remember they had the photo mode in oh, Gran Turismo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The GT5, I think, had it. Or maybe yeah. it was one before. But it was a place, yeah, it was a PlayStation 3 one, GT5, I think. So, I don't know if people are going to do it. It's a very cool feature, though. But it does kind of clue you into the fact there are things we're taking photos of. Like, there are certain vistas that you come across where you're just like, oh, my God, this is absolutely gorgeous. Um, the other thing, too, is, like, I, I like that it's not really a walking simulator, per se, where you're just, like, aimlessly wandering around the entire time wondering if something's ever going to happen. Like, there is some guidance to the game. There are things that actually happen, like you come to this lake and there's these girls skinny dipping like in the <laughs> lake and like they did a good job of making it believable and it really does kind of sink you into this role of being this forestry person who it's his job to protect the forest and, and take care of nature. So, you know, again, walking simulators, not my thing. And you see, I've called it here in the graphics a gawking simulator because there are literally just some parts of the game where you just gawk at it. So... I'm really liking it. I'm like, like I asked you earlier about XCOM. Like if uh, if you know if there are people who don't like strategy games or didn't like XCOM before, does XCOM to change that? Mm -hmm. And you said no. Like you know if you don't like those games previously, your product. I would say that this is a walking simulator for people who have not previously enjoyed walking simulators, and that's big praise from me because I typically hate that genre and feel like it's. <laughs> It's awful easy to make a walking simulator. It's like, just build a world and make people walk slow. So I feel like it's hit, it hit a great balance. I think people who do like walking simulators aren't going to be put off by it either. Because it's not like, it's still not an action game. And it's still not really an adventure game. It's not really puzzles or anything like that. It's a very laid back experience to play. So I feel like it does a great job of kind of hitting that middle ground for people like me. Or for people who do like those types of games. Who just want to meander around and kind of check things out. So... I've been really, really impressed with this game. I'm thinking about it right now as I'm sitting here, <laughs> wanting to go back and play it. That's always the sign of a great game. Um, again, the universe is great. Um, would love to see a sequel to this game as well. Would love to see it come to more platforms, because right now it's not announced for everything, mm. although I'm, I'm assuming... And it I'm also, uh, right now, I think uh, there's sort of a warning up uh, to not get it on PS4 until right. they patch it, because I guess there's some performance issues. I'm playing it on PS4, and they're saying, I mean, I, I've been reading the reports. It's saying there's hitching and there's uh, frame rate issues. I personally have not really had a lot of problems with it. Hmm. I don't know if it's a certain area where there's issues or if there's certain conditions that need to be I met before the issues pop up. I have not played it, and when I do play it, it'll be PC. Yeah. Um, I am excited to play it again. I don't get to everything. I've been playing XCOM and... Uh, the shipments of dynamite are not going to make it from San Francisco to Los Angeles on their own American <laughs> Truck Simulator. But um, I'm surprised to hear you're playing American Truck Simulator over games like Firewatch and, and Unravel. I don't know what's wrong with me when it comes to the truck simulator thing. Like I like your you're not truck alone simulator though. The reviews for that game have been crazy high. Like everyone's giving it a, like an eight out of ten. Yeah, and there's a free demo up. Like go go try it. That's like, right. Really. Today, in fact, there is a free demo up for it, which is really smart. Like they yeah. were smart to put. They probably should have had it out day one. One. Right, because like, I mean, it's a reactionary thing. They're like, "Look, peep, this is probably getting better reviews than they even thought it was going to get." And now yeah. they're like, "Well, hey, like, we got the positive buzz. Let's give people a chance to try this." And it's maybe... a really weird. It shouldn't be fun, but it is. And like, I, I, you know, I played the Euro Truck Simulator too. Was just because I knew some people that was like, oh, "That's really, it's pretty cool. It's, it's not bad." And I think like there was a Steam sale where it was like four bucks or something. So I'm yeah. like, "All right, that's you know, four bucks. That's like a sandwich. Like, you know, let's try it." And like I played it for like 
12 hours in the next like over the next like two days yeah. and it was just like i don't know what it is it's it's like it's basically like a driving sim but slower a lot slower and like <laughs> or you have to i don't the know why, but it's like you know you you start with like you know doing odd jobs with rented trucks and you can get a loan and afford your own truck and then you drive in your own truck and you drive wherever the hell you want like and you, but then you have to worry about sleeping and refueling the truck and repaying for damage as opposed to like when you damage a rental truck they just take it out of your salary but now you have to pay Pick, for it picking up hookers at the truck and then, stop yeah and then you have to like <laughs> i'm uh, assuming that's not part of the no, game right no <laughs> no well not unless you mod it <laughs> yeah there, there's Which mods sure that you will. Will, you'll get there <laughs> And you know, and then like you have to upgrade your your garage, and you can hire other drivers, so you can have a whole trucking business happening. So there's like you're still bringing money in because other drivers are drive, making deliveries that you don't have to make make right. the delivery yeah. on, and then but you can take the important stuff for yourself. And like, yeah. it's crazy. It's it's like it's <laughs> if you if you love like weird simulations of things that like should are super mundane, but like are interesting if you don't have to do them for a living, like truck simulation. It's gonna be like this year's Cities XL, I think. Yeah, I can see that. Especially if they keep the DLC rolling, which I guess is... I'm sure they will. I guess is going to be free for the time being. Like, they're adding a bunch of new Southwest states for free. Well, hopefully they'll get rewarded with sales, so... Yeah. Firewatch, I recommend it. Like I said, hits the medium in between. Like, if you don't like walking simulators, I think you will still enjoy this game. And the people that do like that genre, it doesn't go enough in the other direction to where it's going to turn I don't know if I've really... Like, what what, what would you consider, like, the premier walking simulators? Premiere, like in terms of like the ones that you don't like but are praised, or just kind of like examples. Everybody's gone to the Rapture. Mm, I haven't played that. Yeah, I didn't enjoy that game at all, like at all. Um, remember, I don't know if you remember that game when it first came out. It uh, people didn't realize there was a run button in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Literally for the first like three days it was out, like nobody knew that there was wow. a run in it. Like I don't know how. I mean, when I play a game, I just hit every press everything. Yeah. yeah. But I don't like any of them. Like I don't really like Soma either, and Soma's maybe strays a little bit more towards. I, looked, I didn't play adventure. Soma, but like, Soma was on so many Game of the Year lists that I like stuck it on my wish list on Steam, but I can't quite pull the trigger yet. Yeah, I mean, just games like that, like they're just Amnesia, not my forte. Yeah, yeah, I, I I like the idea. I guess it's maybe you know Firewatch. No disrespect to anyone who does right. like them. Everyone's different. It's just not something. I enjoy. Firewatch might maybe that'll be the key because like I like the idea of it. I just I guess none of them have really grabbed me yet. Well, this one Firewatch is more engaging. It okay. engages the player, whereas a lot of the other walking simulators do their best to disengage the player and just be like, I don't know, do whatever you want. And look, there's a lot of walking around in this game. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of time where you're just walking through the woods and. Whistling, <laughs> whistling a tune or whatever, but uh, I just found it more resting. I feel like it engaged the player a lot more than a lot of them do, and so I think it finds that nice middle ground. Mm. All right, let's move on to the last topic, and probably one that you guys have all been watching the graphics waiting to get to this entire episode. And in hindsight, maybe I should have had this at the top of the show, because I have a feeling a lot of people maybe mm. tuned in for the stream just wanting to watch this segment of the show. You're, oh. you're a jerk. What the hell? <laughs> I didn't want to do it at the top of the show because I knew I was probably going to get emotional about it, and I don't want to make like the rest of the show like a complete shit show. Because yeah, is... there's no crying in XCOM, people. <laughs> not even just the crying. Fury. Just... But, uh, not I'll, even... t- I'll tell you about one of the things about XCOM that like my girlfriend thinks is hilarious is like when I miss a shot, one of my most common exclamations is, oh, come on! Yeah. And one of my soldiers says that about half the time when he misses a shot. <laughs> so you'll hear me go, oh, come on! And then the, then the soldier on the computer will go, will, will go, oh, come on! And like... She thinks it's funny every single time. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I just didn't want to get into, like, a dour mood and then have to go through the rest of the topics mm. in the show because I would have had, like, no energy and I'd just been like, let's just end it. So. <laughs> I'm unraveling. Yeah, I'm un- exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, got to the point where we're going to talk about GT going under. Uh, you're going to have to bear with me a little bit because, you know, it's hard for me to tell what people give a crap about regarding this whole thing and what they don't give a crap about. So there's going to be a little bit of a history lesson here talking about how GT came to be, how it really started, and how it took off, and then ultimately what amounted to its demise. Because that is the question I've got the most on social media over the last couple of days from people on Twitter, people on Facebook, is what the hell happened? How could this happen? Uh, because a lot of people just assume once you're well-established company like Game Trailers was that you're just kind of set and you're just good to go. And I think everybody's learned a really hard lesson uh, in the last couple of days that that's simply not the case. So 
Let's start at the beginning. So I'm working with you at G4. I'm the editorial mm-hmm. director at G4, segment producer on X Play with you. After we've already been through a merger and moved to LA. Yeah, and look, this is nothing new to me. Like I've been through downsizing, yeah. restructuring, I can't sales. How many, one, two, three. I I survived seven rounds of layoffs at, G, at yeah. Tech TV and G4. I mean, look, it all starts there because yeah. I was working with Matt on X Play in San Francisco. Comcast buys Tech TV, merges it with G4, and they tell us you have to move to LA or you lose your job. So we all moved to LA. We're like, we'll give it a Not shot. Not counting all the people that just lost their job, period. Who just got laid yeah, off. Like, we, we actually were lucky and got the option. Yeah. If we wanted to keep our jobs, we could move to LA. So a lot, some people begrudgingly, some people not as much, moved to LA. And then how much longer did we work? I worked at G4 another three years in LA before mm, MTV came calling. I want to say it was more like two years. Was it? Yeah. So I worked a few years at G4. Um, mid 2006, I think, was when you when you left. Early 2006. Early, I started. Okay. I started at GT. We came down here in August 2004. Yep. I started at GT March of 2016. March 18th of 2016. Right. I know the exact day that I started there. So, I worked at X Play for a couple years in G4 in general for a couple years. I basically get headhunted by MTV to come over and run this new website that they had just acquired. So. I go over and interview the guy who did the interview, this guy named John Slusser, a really nice guy. He and I really hit it off. Um, They had a lot of money that Viacom was willing to invest in the website. Um, I didn't know anybody who who was working currently. They didn't really have anybody who was working on the website. It was pretty much just the guys who had founded it. So it was John Slusser, who had been like the investor in GT that took them from just like working in a garage and gave them their first office. And then it was Brandon Jones, who you guys all know, who was one of the co-founders, and this other guy named Jeff Groats, who was the other co-founder. And it was pretty much them and like one or two video editors when I went in to interview. And so I've told this story before, but I did interview with John, and he liked me, and he's like, okay, I want you to do an interview with everybody else. So I call in, and it's like this conference call. And actually, this was out in the parking lot of G4. I was still working at G4. <laughs> and... Uh, they're talking and they're like, okay, they'd already figured out at that point that I was going to accept the job. It was going to be editor in chief of the site or whatever. And so they're telling me, and it's basically like their weekly meeting because they had people that worked all over the place. They didn't all work in the office. And so it's like their weekly meeting and they wanted, John wanted me to get in on the meeting and kind of meet everybody through the phone or whatever. And so we go through this whole thing and I kind of introduce myself, tell them like where I'm from and all the stuff that I had done and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, okay, well, there's one thing we want to talk to you about. And, we're, and I'm like, okay. And I got really nervous and they're like, so we're reviewing Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter right now, and we're going to give it a 10. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, like, hell you are. And I'm like in this weird position of like, okay, I don't really know any of these people. I don't want to seem like the jerk or like the holier than thou. And I just beg them. I'm just like, please, please don't do this. I'm like, you don't understand. Like, Once you give it that 10, I'm like, that's something I'm going to have to deal with as the editor-in-chief of this website for forever. People were, oh, they didn't get it because they didn't really come from like the yeah. editorial space. They're just like, we really like endless, this game. Endless, endless, oh, not as good as Advanced Warfare. Exactly. Warfighter. Warfighter. They're like, they don't get like the repercussions of it. I'm like, just please trust me on this. Like, I've been doing this a long time. I know how this is going to affect things way on down the road. They're like, okay, we'll think about it. Next day, the review goes up 9.9. <laughs> and I think, you know, people were throwing around this week that the highest reviewed game ever on GT was like several like 9.8s. And I gave one to like Super Mario Galaxy 2 and one to Halo 3, and there was a couple others in there. But actually, I think still on the website, if you go to Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter, I think the 9.9 for that game is still there. So Didn't they just re-review Bloodborne and give it a 10, though? Yeah, but that was just kind of like a nod thing or whatever. So <laughs> Maybe they should have re-reviewed Grawl yeah, and dropped it down to like the still 8 10. that it deserved. Yeah. <laughs> so. so anyway, that's how it all started. And I go for my first day of work, and John had talked a big game to me or whatever and said, you know, we have all this money. So I go for my first day of work, and I'm like... Okay, where's my workspace? And he points to a table pushed up against the wall. <laughs> and I was just like, man, look, I'm not a prima donna or anything. I didn't have an office. I just had a cube. No, we were all G4. in like a bullpen situation. And I, generally, I like just working around other people anyway. I don't like being stuffed away in an office. I didn't really want an office, but I was like, holy cow, man. Like, <laughs> And he's like, there's your phone. And he put the phone on the table, and he's like, there you go. And I was just like, holy crap. I immediately went outside called my wife and I'm like, I think I made the biggest mistake of my entire career. <laughs> Seriously. 
And I was like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Why did I do this? And she's like, just give it a couple days. Literally within two days, I was like, this is the best decision I ever made in my life. So just to kind of set it all up, I go there. They have a, Viacom is heavily invested in game trailers. Like literally, they gave us a blank check to do whatever we wanted. And I've got to say, those were probably, save for like the, the glory years of X-Play, were like the best years of my career. Mm-hmm. Having a blank check to do whatever you wanted where the possibilities are just completely endless. We, we had that at the time uh, at X-Play as well. Right around when you left for another year, I'd say. Yeah. We had basically free reign to do whatever the hell we wanted and nobody... And, and, you know, and GT had that longer than we did, but it was like that like weird mid-2000s shifting to late-2000s. Like, there was that period where like a lot of outlets just kind of were allowed to do whatever they wanted and you got some of the best content and best personalities out of that. Well, here's the thing. Viacom had literally just spent like half a billion dollars on digital properties. So they had bought us and like these other weird sites like Neopets and like just... Oh, Neopets. Oh, wow. they bought... They were so stupid with the way they spent their <laughs> money on websites. Like the only smart purchase that they made was game trailers. And look, I'm not just saying that because, you know, we ended up becoming something ultimately and the other sites went away. Like... They were just dumb. Like, I could have told them that their purchases were stupid if they had just asked somebody who had actually worked in digital for a while. So anyway, at first, Viacom was amazing. Like, they literally, like the SVP who worked over us was incredible. He totally got it. He didn't know anything about games, but he was smart enough to know that he didn't know anything about mm. it and smart enough to know that he hired these people because they did know about it and that he should trust those people. And so... Rare. It was rare. He was amazing. Like, I wish he could have stayed our SVP the whole time. The SVP is going to be a recurring theme, by the way, (laughs) throughout this whole discussion. So, our first SVP was incredible. We had the blank check. We could basically do whatever we wanted, and we we did it intelligently. I built an entire editorial team. I hired everybody. Ryan Stevens, all the people we talked about earlier that I hired. um, I hired all those people. We built a whole... Edit bay. We had 14 edit bays with 14 editors cranking literally around the clock. Just we became a machine, and the website just exploded. Like I think my first when I started there, their monthly uniques were like three or four hundred thousand people a month, and within two years, it was at around 10 million uniques. Like it is just it was just a monumental rise. But again, it was because the guy who was above us got it, and we were getting results. And so, you know, GT launched before YouTube, really. Like, mm-hmm. at least it originally launched. I was about in- to say, it's doubly impressive that you have that many uniques with that video player. Right. Well, <laughs> see, here's the thing. When GT first launched, it was hand-built by the guy who was built Sifted, Brent mm-hmm. Phillips. And look, Sifted's a fucking awesome site, man. Like, Brent is really good at what he does. And so, when we first started, we had our own site. We had our own website, we had our own player, we had our own community, our own forums, our own everything. It was nothing like any of the other sites anywhere else in Viacom. And again, they got it. They're like, games are different and we don't know games. And like, these guys are telling us that they need an HD player. We had an Mm -hmm. HD player. No one else at Viacom had any. We taught people at Viacom how to produce in HD. Like, they came to us and asked us, like, what camera should we buy? Like, what should we do about our edit bays? Like, we were way ahead of these huge networks, MTV, Spike. None of them were HD, and we were, and we were producing HD people, content. They used to, I remember the, the top people at G4 used to come to us and be like, how come Game Trailers is doing so much better than we are? And we'd be like, because they have HD players. Like, yeah, they have, and games they are have HD. HD content. Like, yeah. that's what games look like now. Like, they, you know, Microsoft pushed that, and uh, Sony pushed that so super hard for the 360 and the PS3. And GT was the only place you could see it the way it was supposed to look. Yep. And so we, look, we created our own user-generated stuff. Like, we were YouTube before there was YouTube, and it was all just for video games. And it all just worked. Every show we launched, people loved. We, our initial strategy, and my initial strategy when I started at GT was, it's all about the games. And that's what I told everybody I hired, everybody who worked underneath me. I was like, it's not about us, it's about the games. And so when we wrote, it wasn't I. Like, and you'll never see, and maybe, I mean, that eventually I think changed once I left GT. But if you go look at any of the reviews for the first seven or eight years that that website ran, you will never, ever find the word I in any of our reviews. And it was never people saying, I like this, I like that. We, it was always we, if we even recognize us at all. Mm-hmm. And uh, so 
we did that at first and it was just a smashing success. But then people, you know, they, they, they knew I worked there kind of and like the guys who were working for me were like, you know, like it's weird to work someplace and not have anyone know that like this is my review or anything like that. So we started to work a little bit more on bringing our personalities out into the front. So we launched Invisible Walls. Um, and Invisible Walls originally still kind of clung to that whole thing because it didn't show us on camera. It actually showed little caricature images of us and they would light up when one of us would talk so you'd know who it was. Hmm. But then eventually got, people got to know us that way and uh, they were like, well, we want to see you guys on camera. And we were like, I don't know if you guys want to see us on camera. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea. But they're like, no, that's what we want. And so eventually Invisible Walls moved into camera work. Now, while this is happening, things are starting to change. So YouTube is launched and it's doing well. Um, on YouTube, there is a YouTube channel called Machinima. Now, the problem with GT was it became so successful that it became the backbone that supported like a whole wing of Viacom's digital business. So we were eventually umbrellaed under this thing called Spike Digital Entertainment. And that was like a whole network of websites. The problem was all those other websites weren't doing squat and GT was just a beast. So all our sales and marketing people were relying on us to get their sales through. So they they sign a deal with Heinz Ketchup or whatever, and they'd need to do a million ad views in a month or whatever. But Heinz signed the deal with Spike.com or with MTV.com. Problem is, there wasn't enough traffic on those websites to get through that ad sale. So if they didn't do it, they would lose money or they have to give money back and they weren't gonna do that. So what happened was the ad frequency on GT just started getting more and more. At first it was like, okay, look, We'll help you guys out, but the worst we're going to do is one ad every three video views. And that would last like a month. And then they'd ha then it would happen again. They didn't have the enough inventory on the other sites. And they'd come to us again. Well, we need to do like one every two videos now. And we'd fight it for a while. And eventually someone would come to us and be like, you're doing it. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can hear your argument with me all day on the SVP. You're running another ad per view. And then eventually it just got to where it was one to one. And people stuck with us through that by the way, like I was impressed by that. Like people complained a little bit here and there and I hated it and everyone who was on the editorial team freaking hated it, but people stuck with us and, and, and stayed with GT during that process. So while this is happening, YouTube is starting to rise. And YouTube, to give you a little bit of perspective, I've seen a lot of comments over the last few days about people like, well, I'll tell you why GT failed. It's because they wouldn't work with YouTube and they wouldn't get on YouTube. Well, let me tell you something. It wasn't that we didn't want to get on YouTube. The problem was Viacom was suing YouTube for like a billion dollars. And let me tell you, if you worked at Viacom while that court case was going on, you knew about it. And it was something that people talked to you about all the time. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, fuck YouTube, because they screwed us. They screwed so many people to build their business. And look, I know a lot of you watching this like, I like my YouTubers and my, well, they built their business on bullshit. We would go to YouTube and we would find our top 10, our GT countdowns with like 5 million freaking views. And, ba and the, the messed up thing about it was it wasn't YouTube's responsibility to keep track of like all the content that they were stealing. It was your job. Like, mm -hmm. so we had to hire people to go to YouTube and try to find every instance of our videos that had been stolen and were serving ads against them. It, it drove me bonkers. I'm like, so wait a minute. We could have done 3 million views of this video and we wouldn't have to have an ad frequency of one to one because we'd be serving more videos. Instead, these yahoos stole our video and posted it on YouTube or it did another 3 million views. It was infuriating. And then, you know, we weren't allowed to go there. And we're like, well, look, look at what our content's doing on YouTube and by it comes, you're not going on there. We're suing them right now. We're not going to put our content on YouTube. We were like between a rock and a hard place. So all the people saying that like GT didn't join YouTube soon enough, screw off. Like, you know what you're talking about. Like we wanted to go on YouTube, we couldn't because of Viacom. So while this happens, Machinima launches. And when YouTube first like came around, like there were really no ads on YouTube. Like whoever invested in YouTube was losing money hand over fist hmm. because they were hardly running ads at all. So this channel pops up called Machinima. And I think they're still around. They're something different now because they've been kind of eclipsed by all these other YouTube channels. Yeah, they've channels. gone through some change. They're, they seem to be kind of moving into more of a production company model now. Yeah. So this channel pops up, Machinima, who basically just tries to be, and look, they, they told me as much. They, in fact, one of the people who worked at Machinima like, said to me at an event one time, like, it's our goal to kick your guys' ass. 
And what that had amounted to was them coming to our website every day and ripping shit off of our, our website and posting it on their YouTube channel. We caught like our watermarks in their videos all the freaking time. They were like that little fish that swims around the shark's mouth, just like waiting for a little nibble of food to come out of the, out of the mouth. Like, so this channel Machinima starts taking all our stuff, putting it on their channel with no ads. And so what, what starts to happen? We start to see our traffic for our trailers just starting to take a nosedive because there's ads before every trailer. And look, it sucks. We didn't want to run ads. We didn't want to make people watch a 30 second ad before a 30 second trailer. It's ridiculous. We got it. We didn't have a choice. We, that was what Viacom mandated that we do. So that was, I guess when it really started to happen was around 2008. In 2008, we served a billion videos on GT, a billion videos. That was the peak. And then right around then, Machinima started rising and our trailer traffic started going down. So what we did is we're like, okay, we're losing trailer traffic. We just took all our money and started putting it into original content. Um, also, while this is happening, we get our show on Spike TV, GTTV. We're getting pretty much every exclusive on the planet, literally every exclusive piece of video. Between me and Jeff Keeley, if there was a new piece of video, either I ran it first on the website or Jeff ran it first in Game Trailers TV. And that's just the way it was. But YouTube starts to rise, our trailer traffic starts to fall, and around the same time, we get a new SVP. Somebody, the old guy decided to move on, he went somewhere else, and we get a new guy who doesn't really give a crap. He wasn't a part of the purchase. He has no affinity towards game trailers at all. He's just like, this is my best performing website right now on, on my portfolio of websites that I run. It wasn't, he didn't care about games. He didn't care about GT as a site. We were just a tool for him as a manager to do his job, essentially. And that's when things started to change. That's when we, they were like, started talking to us about, well, you know, you can't really have your own website here. Like you, you need to kind of fall in line with these other websites. And like, they started like talking, like we had these awesome programs where if people use our website, they got free stuff, like literally like a free PSP. Like you could watch videos on our website and get a free PSP from it with our program that we had. And he started wiping out that program. He's like, we need to sunset that program. Like any of the really cool stuff that like our website had slowly started being taken away from the website. And so our views start to fall. The pressure from ad sales starts to get more intense. I start going out on marketing meetings to try to get sponsorships because that was the only way that we could lower the ad frequency to make our site a better place to visit. So I start going out with the marketing team to meet these companies and try to generate cash and it the other part of it too is that this is also the period where when i would ask to ask you how things were going you would sigh yeah because the other part of it too this is where it stopped being what you wanted it to be well the other part of it too was because gt did so well i was promoted and so a lot of people don't realize this but i was a vp of content at viacom i was also still the editor-in-chief of game trailers but i also was responsible for all these other websites i was basically responsible for all the websites under that banner i talked about earlier and so I was getting stretched really thin and they're making me fly around now because, and I wanted to, because one, our marketing team started trying to sell stuff that wasn't editorially prudent mm -hmm. because they wouldn't think about like, how is this going to sacrifice our editorial integrity if we do this program? Like one day they came to me they're like, okay, we signed this deal for this. And I'm like, you can't do that. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, because that's a conflict of interest for us. We're an editorial outlet. Like you need to talk to me before you sign stuff like this. And so it just started, what happens is, it's all good times, man. The good times were rolling. And then eventually just the corporate creep started happening. Mm -hmm. And they start trying to use you to make all boats rise, to right. use corporate jargon that was used all the time. We need to use GT to make all the boats rise. And it's like, we'll do what we can. But what it ended up doing was we're going to sacrifice what makes GT great to try to make my whole portfolio look better. So... Around 2011, our numbers had really started to decline. Everybody's were though, like GameSpot, IGN, everybody. Mm -hmm. So, and our numbers weren't declining at a higher rate than anyone else's. Like you could look at our curve and you could get IGN's curve and GameSpot's curve and they were like, you could lay them on top of each other and they were like identical. But still, it, regardless of that, it's like, it's a cause for alarm. Like you need to start thinking about doing things differently. How can we stem the tide of losing our users, blah, blah, blah. So. We launched a bunch of shows, like I mentioned earlier, but that is where corporate really started getting involved. And so what their, their perspective was, well, 
if you just keep doing the same thing over and over, and what, in their opinion, doing the same thing over and over was creating content for hardcore gamers. And so that spurred what you're seeing right now, which is GT Motion. So they came to us. Yeah, Chilon. Yeah, Chilon. Again, somebody I brought from G4 yeah. over to GT. Tech TV. Yeah. So they, they're like, you guys need to start doing something differently. That spurred GT Motion, which I told them was a horrible idea. It's going to flop. No one's going to care. There's no audience for this stuff. They, they made us do a mobile gaming site. Again, it's going to flop. Nobody goes online to look for mobile information. They made us start like a blog because they're like, oh, look, the one website that hasn't really lost as much traffic as everybody else is Kotaku, and they're a blog. So let's start a blog. And so I hired somebody from Kotaku to come over and do the job, Michael McWhirter. He came over and ran our side mission blog. Once you've established your identity, and the identity then and still today, and if you look at everything that people have written for the last couple days, GT was a video portal for video games. Once you've established that identity, that's what people come to you for. And so these people were starting to meddle and trying to change the site's identity. And look, I love Michael McWhirter, and I like the work that he did on Side Mission. And I thought Side Mission was a good blog, but that's not what people came to GT for. And so instead of spending the money that we could have spent to create another three shows to get people to come to the site for what they come to the site for, we're blowing all this money. I mean, look, you saw GT Motion. That was not a cheap production, man. There was a lot of money siphoned into that against the wishes of the editorial team. Nobody on the editorial team wanted GT Motion. We love Chi Lon. You love Chi Lon. She's great. And she did a great job on that. And I mm -hmm. thought the site did a great job on it. We did the best we could with what we were forced to do. But again, it was completely out of our control. There was nothing we could do. And then comes the site replatform. And this is what really killed game trailers. So one day they just come to us and they're like, look, we're going to replatform. And every website across Viacom is going to be all the same. And as we mentioned earlier, Viacom didn't even really have an HD player for its other websites until like 2010 or something like that. And it was awful. And so, you know, we go into all these meetings and we're sitting in there and we're like, this is a horrible idea. They're like, we're taking away everyone's blogs. We're taking away leveling. We're taking away achievements. We're getting rid of the user generated video. Like they just murdered the site because there were so many parts of it that were not a part of anything else at Viacom. And we saw it coming. Like, we knew it was going to be bad. We started working on the replatforming. It was a total disaster. We lost 30,000 redirects on launch day of the new website. So what, just for those of you who don't work online and may not understand what that means, so when you replatform onto a new platform, they do what's called redirects, which basically takes the new website and links that new website to that old video that you had on the old website. On day one, we lost 30,000 redirects. Basically 30,000 pieces of content that if somebody searches on Google and clicks it, it now goes to a 404 page. 30,000. So right then, traffic just literally, the day we launched that new site, boom, like all the way down. And that was, that was where, that was it. That was pretty much it. The people who did stick around with GT and that player, thank you. Like, I really appreciate it. We knew that player sucked. It sucked until the day it got replatformed a month ago by Defy. Like, it still sucks. Mm. Like, those people who work on MTV.com, Spike.com, or whatever, I wish you luck. Because that player is still freaking awful. Not that Defy's was any better. And so, that was the end for GT. And I think I probably explained, like, what built up to all those problems. And then, as you guys all know, right after 2012, I come back from 20 for 2013, and I leave because I knew what was coming on. I... The writing was on the wall at that point. Um, GT gets sold to Defy for basically, for what they say in, in hockey, would be a bag of hockey pucks. Hmm. Like, literally, no money really exchanged hands. Like, they gave, like, Defy, or Defy gave Viacom, like, some shares of its company. Like, I don't even know what Defy shares are worth at this point. Like, I have no probably, idea. basically, Viacom gave the website to Defy. So, Defy is not invested in game trailers at all. And look, I'm gone. Defy came by and picked the couch up off the curb. Pretty much. Basically. Pretty much. And look, I wasn't there. So I'm not going to go too in-depth about what happened with the Defy folks because, you know, some people have told me stuff, but I'm not at liberty to really share that stuff, and I'm not going to because I respect the people who told me that information. But as a complete outsider and someone who understands digital 
and knows GT and knows how these deals work, I can talk a little bit about it. So DeFi gets GT for nothing, basically. It's given to them because Viacom has no real digital presence and wants its hand in digital. So it figures this is its way to do it. We'll give you this digital property. You give us some stock of your digital company. Everybody's happy. So DeFi really has no incentive to make GT work. It's like a wild card to them. They're like, well, this could work and become huge. You know, they see the numbers. They mm-hmm. see where they had just gone down, 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 down. So they're like, well, maybe we can turn this around. Maybe it could become something lucrative to us. But more more likely, they're really saying, like, if it doesn't work, so what? Like, yeah. we, we, have, we haven't invested anything in it. Like, you know, we're not paying the people a ton of money who are working on the site. And uh, so when you're not incentivized in something, you have no reason to really care. And mm-hmm. as an outsider, again, like, I don't know this because I wasn't working. I never worked a day at Defy with the GT crew, but you can just see it because when they first got there, they had nice studios. And like, I went and shot a couple episodes of Bonus Round. I was like, wow, this is really nice. Like, they've taken care of you guys. I remember telling Brandon, like, walking up and giving him a hug. And I'm like, dude, this is awesome, man. Like, I was worried about when you guys came over here. Like, they've set you up. They've taken care of you guys. And, uh, but then you just started watching and like that studio, they stopped Bonus Round Mm -hmm. because Bonus Round, and people have been asking me, why why don't we do Bonus Round? Why did Bonus Round stop? It's because it's crazy freaking expensive. It's like you're flying in all those people and putting them up Mm -hmm. in a hotel, like it's a lot. And if the show does a hundred- It's TV money. Yeah, Yeah. it's TV money. It was a legitimate production. And when GT was rocking, it wasn't a problem. But when you're really starting to think about your budget, what you do is you look at cost per video view. And it doesn't work out for a, for a show like Bonus Round online. So you, what you started seeing was them getting shuffled around. Mm-hmm. Like, look, if you are valued at a company, you don't get shuffled around. The other people get shuffled around. And you see them shuffling around you. That's the way it was at GT. It's like they gave us a studio right off the foyer of MTV. Like, here's a little trailer. Mm-hmm. Here's our studio. Like, that's when you know you matter when you're the one given that stuff and all the other people are like how did you get that but you could see with you guys back in the day were like visiting that place was like wow you guys are in the thick oh yeah everything well see look we had we had a tv show on mtv2 Mm. we had a tv show on spike like it was insane because we went in there and we kicked ass like we we earned it like they didn't Mm. just give it to us and i should also note that like uh when game trailers tv stopped um the people at g4 like updated their resumes because like it was having GT there, like it was kind of like, okay, video game content on television is a thing, yeah. and there's competition, and we're fighting for some of the same content. You guys always won, but like, because um, Keeley got exclusives, like, like breathing. Yeah. But like, uh, when that went off the air, we're like, oh, well, we better start packing up. Yeah, it was, it was, it was yeah. just like, like the writing was on the wall for see, the we, industry. See, here's the thing: like, we always rooted for you guys because we knew that our health. And your health, we, we were Very it, it was symbiotic. Yeah, yeah, like, for sure. And I know that. I know when that show was shut down, that's exactly what you thought. Oh, crap. Just mm-hmm. like when we found out, and if you guys were having problems over there, we're like, oh, crap. Like, we need each other, like, to make it seem viable to people who don't know what the hell they're talking about. Because mm-hmm. that's really what it comes down to. You're dealing with people. Two giant corporations that, like, if, that are clueless. If, yeah, and if no one else is doing what you're doing, and the thing you're doing isn't a runaway success, as a giant corporation, you're just going to think, well, why are we doing that? Yeah. So I did wait. I did miss a very important element of this whole thing, and I can't believe I totally forgot it, and that is ad blocker. Mm. Before, even before our replatform, the reason we really lost a lot of traffic, a lot of revenue was ad blocker. So just to be completely candid, the first couple of years at GT at MTV, we lost money. It was expected, though. You don't just start a website with like 300,000 uniques and expect to like make a million dollars right away. Within two years, we were profitable. By the third year, we had a 30% profit margin. So basically, to let, kind of let you know how it works, for every $2 we spent, we made a dollar. And in business terms, that is a huge profit margin. A 30% profit margin is almost unheard of, particularly in digital. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were like a sensation in Viacom. People were like, holy crap, how are these mm-hmm. guys? And I'll tell you how we did it. We worked our freaking asses off. I worked 70 hour weeks for seven years. That's how it happened. It wasn't luck or it wasn't just some magic potion or some weird equation. It was sweat and no sleep. And not just me either. Like my whole team worked their asses to the bone, period. That's how it happened. So 
right around 2010, literally, like overnight, we lost 30% of our revenue, like overnight. Like, I don't know, even know when Adblocker launched. Maybe that was the year it launched, but for whatever reason, like it hit us like a ton of bricks. So basically we went from a 30% profit margin to breaking even like mm. overnight. And it wasn't that our views had changed or anything else had changed. Just all of a sudden people weren't watching ads because they were using ad blocker on our website. So look, the people who are saying, oh, why did GT die? If you're using ad blockers, like you should feel bad because you are part of the reason GT is no longer here. And it's only gotten worse. Like now ad blocker is like almost 50% of people who surf traffic on tech and gaming websites. Like. That's why Sifted is a subscription website. We would never survive with an ad model. We just wouldn't because people who are gamers are really tech savvy. Like my mom is like, ad blocker? I don't even know what that is. Like, why would I install something into my brow? That doesn't, it'll make it run slower, Shane. <laughs> but people like us know. It's right. like, oh no. Like everybody who's in games and tech, like most people use freaking ad blocker. And if people will, and you know, the old argument is, oh, well, you know, if the websites weren't giving us crappy ads, then that is the biggest freaking cop out ever. There's been like one ad in the history of the internet that Yahoo served that gave people a virus. And that is like what people fall back. Oh, I've been getting viruses from flash ads. It's like, it doesn't even, it killed game trailers. You can sit there and deny it all you want, but I'm telling you right now, you and your ad blocker killed game trailers. And there's a bunch of people on the street right now because of it. Look, there's other factors, mitigating factors that are involved in it, but I'm telling you like, if I can change 10 people who are watching this right now to stop using ad blockers on the sites that they say they care about, then it's worth it because it is killing the internet. And if you want to keep free content, you're going to have to turn off your ad blocker. And look, I get it. There are some websites that are obnoxious. Like you can see it. I use ad blocker on sites sometimes like ESPN because it has 58 ads, mm. but most gaming websites, worst case scenario, there's like 10. And you don't get like the eye blasters anymore that like pop up and like take over your screen. Like websites have got it. Like they've turned, they've toned their ads down. They realize like what it's done. But the bottom line is you're taking money out of the hands of these people who are working their butts off. It was really frustrating for me to watch like all these people commenting about, oh, these guys, I love them so much. And how am I going to survive without seeing them every week? Well, where were you like the last three years when you were taking money out of their pockets? Like, I don't, I've never seen an argument for using ad blocker that has made a lick of sense to me. And I, look, a big part of it is because I work in digital and I know the ins and outs of how it works and I know what it does to a company. I know what it did to GT. And so ad blocker killed game trailers. Like if there's one thing that if somebody asked me what killed GT, all the other stuff that I talked about definitely has an impact on it. But what really killed it was ad blocker. And if you start seeing some of these other big sites going down, Maybe some of you guys like some of the big sites that still exist. There aren't many left, but you start seeing them go down. That's why they're going to go down too. It's not anything else. It's ad blocker taking 30% or 40% of their revenue off the top. How can any company survive? Imagine if you worked in a cab and every night when you finished your shift, you had to hand somebody half of your money. That's what it's like working online right now. That's what you're doing. No other person in the world has to do that. I mean, we get our taxes taken out, yeah. but you get your taxes taken out after ad blocker as well. So think about that. Yeah. It's like, seriously, people, if you want the, the sites or the people that you want to support to keep doing what they're doing, you've got to turn off your ad blocker on their, on their page. That's just all there is to it. And look, if their ads get obnoxious, just don't go there anymore. Like, it's very simple. Like, don't go there and leech their content for free. It's like, that's the real killer. I'm going to turn on an ad blocker and I'm going to suck up all their bandwidth watching HD video. <laughs> How do you ever, can you ever rationalize that being okay? It's not okay. And there's people without jobs right now because of that way of thinking. So, so anyway, sold to Defy. Over time, you start seeing their studio gets cut down and they're constantly saying, oh, you know, we, we got moved into a new studio and you'd see episodes of their show that where they'd just be in front of a green screen, whereas before they had like an actual set and like, you get to see it. Defy had no incentive to make GT a success. It was a roll of the dice that they paid nothing for. And they just kept calling it down and calling it down until ultimately they did the scummiest thing ever, which is let people come back from a holiday 
work for a month and a half, have one of your employees get married and go on his honeymoon, and then yank the carpet out from underneath them. Like, like I don't know. With one day notice. Like, that, that's what really blows look, my mind. Look, here, I've never seen that before. Here's the thing, Matt. Look, we don't know. Like, they, they'll say, like, there wasn't a warning, but... Rarely does this ever happen where right. somebody was Usually in, you sense it or you hear it. Or at someone... the very least you sense it, but chances are somebody who worked on GT had a meeting with somebody where it was at least hinted to them that, hey, things aren't going so mm-hmm. great. We really kind of need to turn it around. I mean, I think we, you thing. know, uh, there's, there, was a, there was a scent in the air a little bit, I think just in general, um, but I thought they would finish out the fiscal. I didn't think it would be this soon. Well... Here's, here's the messed up part, is that they just re-platformed right. GT. Which makes me again wonder, I mean, I realize Defy didn't pay much for this whole thing, but it makes me wonder, like, what what the, what were they after? Like, what what did they think was, like, why... It's like I said, it was a roll of the dice, a wild card. Go, to go so far to, like, you know, re-platform, and then just saying, eh, nah. Like, it was like, you know, and I've, we've seen things like, you know, a similar, not similar, but like a, 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 a comparable thing happened to uh, unscrewed with Martin Sargent when we yeah. moved down here, where we all moved down. Yeah, yeah. The end of July in 2004. And a month they, later, they can him. November 11th. They were, they'd been here for three months. Yeah. And some people, you know, some people got moved to new departments, but a lot of the people on that show, Unscrewed, it's like we, mo- yeah, we paid to move you to LA, and it's been three months. And happy Thanksgiving. You're on. The, you're out. And you have a year lease. Yeah. <laughs> and you, and you sign a year lease yeah. in LA. <laughs> like so, go find another job. So. I mean, it happens. I mean, um, look, some things in corporate America just don't make any sense at all. Like, why go through the whole process of replatforming GT onto your platform and getting all their video, like all the redirects I was talking about that screwed GT that didn't work? Like, you're doing that again with GT with Defy's platform. So, why go through all that hassle, getting the player to work, connecting all those dots between all those videos in the website? And literally, I mean, they just really got it done like three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I mean, they launched it first, and like the embed player was all screwed up. Like, it, like you'd watch an embed, and there was no like player controls to use. You'd have to mm. watch like the whole thing play. Like, but they eventually got it sorted. Like, and in fact, I think just last week they finally got the embeds working right, so that they played nicely with Sifted. So, and then a week later, they can the whole thing. And the thing is, is like you know, they probably came back from the holidays. They had their big come to Jesus like kickoff 2016 meeting, and. That was the end result of it. And a lot of times when things like that happen in corporate America, there's nothing you can do. There's no rationale to be spoken about it. And they don't care about how much money they spent. So yeah, at that point, they're just moving pieces around. Yeah. And here's the thing I do want to say, too, about the people who worked on game trailers after I left. Like, I have the utmost respect for you guys. You, look... If everybody else from the outside could see what was going on, you guys could see what was going on. And to come to work every day and bust your ass and be professional and in all honesty do some amazing work, that deserves all the props in the world. You guys were soldiers, you you persevered. And it's very easy to start, when you start seeing things kind of crumbling down around you, to start phoning it in or just being like, well, this is good enough. And you guys never did that. And uh, you know, Brandon Jones deserves a lot of credit for that. You know, when you're a leader, it's your job to shake it off and put on the happy face. And look, I had to do it at GT for the last three years I worked there. As our numbers were like plummeting, and like all my employees are coming to me being like, Shane, what's going to happen? Are we getting fired? I'm like, everything's fine. Everything's going to be good. Like, it's hard because you know, like, you know better than anyone because you're sitting in the meetings where mm-hmm. you're talking with the people above you who are telling you, like, dude, this shit's bad. Like, real bad, Shane. Like, something's got to be done. And then you have to go to your people and be like, look, let's start putting some plans in place. Let's have a meeting, blah, blah, blah. You can't let it shine through. And look, I'm sure Jones was privy to some stuff that the guys who were working for him weren't privy to, and it's hard. It's hard to put on that happy face every day and come to work and kick ass. And uh, you guys did. Like, I don't know if any of you guys are watching this right now. I don't know if Bloodworth is still on the stream or not. But, Blood, you know I love you, man. Like, we went to war many times together. Um, But all you other guys as well, man. Like, I just have mad, mad respect for you guys. You guys really picked the site up by its bootstraps um, when it was down. And uh, it's a shame what happened to you guys. That's the bottom line. And it wasn't your fault at all. It'll never be your fault. You was completely out of your control. You guys did the best you could and then some. So... I guess in the end, man, 
sometimes you just can't stop stuff like this from happening because when corporations get involved, yeah. it's out of your control. Once like the corporate of Eye of, Eye of Sauron moves on to you. Yeah. That tends to be, a, it's a slow, it can be a slow grinding end, but yeah. it's going to be the end. And eventually. look, the SVP who killed GT still works there and still makes a huge salary. And he was a failure. He failed. He failed GT. He failed all the sites that were under his umbrella, to be honest with you. At well, the that's, the, the, that's the thing, isn't it? Like, you, you're handed something that's on that level. You're handing this one billion view, videos served site. And he just and trashed it. And now it's it. gone. It's gone. For, no, for nothing. And he didn't pay any price for that. Instead, right. who paid the price? All the people who busted their asses to make to serve those a billion views. Like, it's, it's mm-hmm. corporate America. And that's exactly why I started Sifted. I never wanted to be a part of any of that shit ever again. I just... It's just disgusting, man. Like, another problem, too, is, like, the one guy who had, like, sold the site to Viacom, like, he got into Viacom, and GT blows up. So, all of a sudden, he's getting promoted, you know? They're like, oh, it's probably because of you that GT did so well. So, he gets promoted up and out of, like, (laughs) up and out, Hmm. gets promoted up and out of game trailers. So, he's not really working with game trailers anymore. So, we lost, like, the guy in our corner who would go to bat for us. Like, that was another problem, too. And he was underneath this SVP with making all the decisions, and it's his boss, so, you know, he's not going to say or make any ways. And I could I could literally go on for days about this. I mean, there's just so... I've got so much yeah. anger in me about it, just about everything. Like, just to watch something be built by, on hard work, because that's what people don't get. It's like, everyone just mm. thinks it's like... Everyone at Viacom just thought it was like, oh, you guys play video games, and it got big. Right. It's like, no, that's not how it happens, man. There's... People playing video games everywhere right now. It's work. It's hard work. It's sacrifice. Sacrificing your time with your wife or your family or yeah. whatever. Like, and those things, you know. And you see, you know, I I went through my own corporate uh, fuckery situation as X Play got canceled with the tag of the show and the rest of G Four and, um, you know, like everybody, even you know, we were told a couple months before the end that like, yeah, this is shutting down in December and you know, da da da. But no one stopped, no one slacked off, no one just wandered away. Everyone was like, oh, we got to make these final shows amazing. Yeah. And because, you know, and you see the same thing with GT all the way to the end, all the way to the, the final live stream last night with, with GT, or uh, on Monday with GTA 3. Like, you know, it's all about the content, it's all about what you built, it's all about the people who watch it. And... You know, I think you definitely see that like in this Right now, by the general. way, you are seeing the champions of game trailers. This montage here is something that we did for Invisible Walls episode 200 where Bloodworth just went around the office and talked to everybody. All these people that you're seeing in this right now mm. deserve your applause. Like, these are the people that built GT, the people that did what I said, sacrificed their lives to make GT something. And, uh... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Fallout statue. Sucks, man really sucks and it's just it's a shame when when that happens and and you know it really comes down to the people in the trenches who like they they all you know we know tons of people work at you know worked at gt worked at g4 worked at every other place in between that you know it's it's personal and it's it's your life and what's you it's what you love and and you're thankful every day that you get to do it um yeah i'm I'm not i'm gonna say of any pro pro wrestling fans in the audience like i i I understood in that it's it's to some small degree what daniel bryan was talking about this week when he just said grateful 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 over and over because like i used to say when i worked at x play uh it beats a real job and it was a real job because we worked really hard we worked really late we worked you know a lot of those special episodes were shot in the middle of the night after a full work day because we just wanted to do it and you know similar things happen at GT all the time, and like you said, you had, you had that machine worked around the clock, and you do it because it's the greatest job you've ever had, yeah. and you never thought you'd get to do that. You know, you, you yeah. get all your other all your friends that don't work in this kind of situation complain about how much they have to, how much it sucks to have to go to work all the time. And meanwhile, actually, and actually, one of the greatest compliments I ever got was when we had first moved down to LA. And one of the first episodes we did, we all kind of divvied up the first three episodes. And I think you did one, and I did one, and all that. And uh, I did one that was a bunch of movie parodies. And so, instead of just cutting normal, like, kind of, you know, magazine format television, we had to cut a bunch of narrative stuff for this movie episode. And our our editor at the time, uh, John French, who was our main editor for many, many years, for many years after that, a great editor, he... um, he uh, you know, he was kind of a dark dark uh, personality, you know, very cynical. Yeah. Um, 
And I and he told it wasn't until years later that he told me this, but because I, I was like, oh my god, these guys are in L.A. and they know what they're doing, and we're like these like guys from this treehouse in yeah. San Francisco, you know. We're doing, and I was trying to get everything set and stuff. And we were you know, these very long edit sessions, getting this all done, and finally it was starting to shape up. And I'm like, oh, I think this is going to work. And I was always worried what he was thinking about all this while I was like bringing him pieces of this jigsaw puzzle all day. And he was until years later. He told me he went back to the back up into the valley, the bar he drank at every night when he got home. He sat down, and everyone was, and people were like, "Hey, how was work today?" And he said, "He said he sat down, and he said, you know what? I think I had my first good day of work ever today." <laughs> and that to me, yeah. that that is one of the greatest things anyone has ever said about working with me. Is yeah. that like, is that you know what we brought? You know what you know, and it was infectious and. The people that worked at G4 at that time and then went to GT brought that with them. Jeremy Hoffman and Ryan Stevens yeah. and all those guys. It's, that's really what it's about, though. It's about the relationships. Yeah. And look, I've worked lots of places where and these people, people are, are two-faced and backstabbers. Yeah. And like, and that's the way a lot of corporate America is. And look, there was that at Viacom. Look, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Like, There's a lot of people that like I thought were friends of mine. And when I left there, I've never heard from them again. People that I gave jobs to where they're making like six figures and it changed their life and they don't give a shit about me like that's the reality of working in corporate america a lot of people are just there to climb the ladder get as much money as they can and get the hell out Mm -hmm. so and that's why i started sifted and like look we're probably going to put this up on youtube one of the rare free episodes we're going to put up just because it's you know this is kind of a a way to celebrate game trailers and so maybe a lot of people are going to watch this for the first time and maybe even been exposed to sifted but man like we have an opportunity to make something here, make something special that isn't run by a bunch of freaking scumbags. Like, support stuff like this. If it's not me, like somebody else. But look, I've tried to do something pure with this website, like something that's different, and it isn't gonna make a bunch of douchebags rich. Like, support it, man. Like, if it's not me, find somebody else to support. Stop giving your money to corporate scum. Like, I guess that's the best way I can put it. And with that... Give it to this scum. (laughs) (laughs) Again, it doesn't have to be me, but find somebody true that you believe in to give your money to and give it to them. And, you know, I think think that's... It is happening with the Twitch stuff and Patreon and Kickstarter. Like, that is... You know, maybe it's not, you know, a focused movement in that regard, but there's that draw to do that now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe Sifted can be part of that. Yep. So... We're going to head to our trailer of the week here in a second. I am guessing there are a lot of questions for this episode. And uh, look, I'll try to answer as many as I can. I'm going to be very respectful to everybody who just lost their jobs at GT. And I'm not going to step out of bounds and answer anything I shouldn't or anything I'm not qualified to talk about, to be honest. So try not to ask me too much about like the Defy years at GT because I don't really want to stray into that territory too much. There are other people who are far more qualified to answer those questions. So if you got any questions about GT or Sifted or whatever, start setting them in now. Uh, we're gonna run our trailer of the week and with the delay on Twitch and everything, by the time that trailer's done, we should be able to have a few questions queued up. So our trailer of the week this week isn't really a trailer, but it's freaking awesome anyway. It is the opening cinematic for Dark Souls 3. Let's roll it. Yes, indeed. It is called Lothric where the transitory lands of the Lords of Cinder converge. In venturing north, the pilgrims discover the truth of the old words. The fire fades, and the Lords go Farron's 
undead legion, the Abyss Watchers. And the reclusive lord of the profaned capital. So I saw some people saying there's spoilers there. It's the opening <laughs> cinema. We're not telling you what happens. Look, We're we didn't, showing you the game. Yeah, we didn't capture that and like put it in the show. That was released officially this week. It's up on Sifted. It's been there for a couple days. We Getting we're, close. We're trying to be nefarious. So uh, so we have got a Two bunch months. of... Yeah, it's coming quick. So we have got a bunch of questions. Thanks, as always, guys, for asking. Uh, the one I see is, where can you get a shirt like mine? You can't. <laughs> This is only for the people who were on the show. In fact, the only other time we gave away any of these shirts was at a PAX panel that we did one year. We gave them away to everybody who showed up to our panel. Um, so there's some floating out there. You might be able to find one on eBay. Uh, it probably won't be cheap. Uh, but otherwise, and the only way you have one is if you worked at GT. So unfortunately, that's how it works. Um, the other question I'm seeing over and over, so I'm not going to mention like one specific person who asked it is, do I want to hire all the people from GT? Yes. I, if I could, I would hire every single person that just walked out the doors of that place, period. The problem is money. If you guys go and subscribe, I'll hire as many as I can, period. Like, but the money's got to be there. And I can't, I can't hire people without the ability to pay them and like a month later be like, sorry, you, know, you missed all these opportunities to work somewhere else because I hired you. And now I can't pay you, so see you later. Like, the money's got to be there. But I guarantee you, if you subscribe to Sifted, I will spend that money to hire people from GT. Period. You have my word of honor. I don't know how I can... There was a Bible here. I don't know if that would help either, but... This is the the man who I trusted to flip a coin over over a text message. Yeah. (laughs) I'm telling you... Shane does what he says he's going to do. If you guys subscribe to Sifted and we get an influx of cash... I will hire these people. Like, the site's there. This is the thing. It's like, Sifted's done. It's there. We have forums. We, it's awesome. We just need to bring in the talent, and we can start making shows tomorrow. Believe it mm-hmm. or not, like, these people don't have to be out of work, like, at all. Yeah. And they're see, local. Yeah. I see a lot of people saying, oh, I'll give the Patreon, oh, blah, 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 whatever. Just get a Sifted subscription. If I wake up on Monday, and there's $20,000 worth of new subscriptions in our account... I'll go hire them right away. It's very simple. Like, if you already have a Sifted subscription, use Gifted. Yeah, buy one, give it to somebody. Like, if you guys are serious about this, and that's the thing. Like, people always talk a mean game. They're always like, "Oh, I'll give it to a Patreon or I'll do this." And you know what? When the time comes, you know, we saw it when we did our two-week free trial before Sifted launched. You know, everybody was like, "Oh my God, this site is awesome! I can't believe you actually got it to work!" And blah blah blah. Like, I go back and look, like, we had this thread, like, a big Q&A thread that we started on the first day, like, the beta started. And this was, like, where people would all come in and, like, 
ask questions about the site, give us feedback, tell us stuff to change and whatnot. I went back and looked at that, like, I don't know, like two weeks ago or whatever, just because every once in a while people will go in there and still ask questions. And I saw so many people, they're like, oh my God, this is like revolutionary, it's genius. How did, Brent is a, is a mad genius for being able to do this. Level two trial user. <laughs> people talk a mean game, man, but when it comes to plunking down that credit card in that web form, people get cold feet. And so look, if you really want to start a revolution, and that's really what this website could be, is you going like this to corporate America and corporate websites, just subscribe. It's that easy. It's really that easy. So look, like I said, I will hire as many people from GT as I can. I love those guys like brothers, period, and always will. We have a special bond. We worked, I mean, I hate to use the word war because there are people out there who are actually in wars, and I don't want to cheapen like what they're doing, but look, we busted our asses, man. Like yeah. We flew around the world without any sleep and then went to Tokyo Game Show and hit the floor and toured a new one. Like Once you do that with a group of people, like you have a bond that like it just never goes away. That's all there is to it, and especially when you have success doing it. Um, it just builds this thing between people that will just never, ever go away. So subscribe. Subscribe, I hire. Subscribe, I hire. It's very simple. It's a simple equation. There's no algebra involved. It's just one leads to another. That's it. What else? Find any other questions in here? Um. <laughs> Hire all nine GT employees <laughs> and I'll subscribe to Sifted for Life. Yeah. Oh, uh, your favorite memory from the time you spent doing Invisible Walls. That's, Who's that from? Uh, that's uh, particularly from Grum Grumbleopolis, but uh, several people have asked it. Uh, my favorite moment on Invisible Walls. I mean, I think episode 200 was kind of the pinnacle of the show. Um,. I mean, look, Marcus and I had legendary arguments, debates, whatever you want to call it. I mean, you can label it whatever you want. And there's lots of those that are memorable, and I'll always talk to people about. And people always, when they see me at E3 or whatever, they come up and be like, oh, I remember that discussion you and Marcus had. But really, Invisible Walls episode 200 was really the landmark episode. Because one, it was like live, back before people were streaming on Twitch or YouTube or wherever. It was a completely live show. It was packed wall-to-wall -wall with guests. We had, like, Naughty Dog on the show and a bunch of other developers and people. We debuted, like, seven exclusive trailers. We launched, like, five new episodes or five new shows during that show because um, I had had all my guys go and be, like, like three months beforehand. They, I'm, like, come up with a new show idea. We'll work on it. We'll incubate it, and then we'll launch it during Invisible Walls 200, and that's what we did. Um, it was during, it was when the site was really full throttle, it was really successful, our traffic was through the roof, our revenue and our, and our uh, profit was through the roof. It was just, it was the pinnacle. It was the best of times. It's when we would put up a review and it would do 1.5 million views. Like, you know, I was just on GT a couple months ago and I looked at a review, you know, and just looking at the views to see where it had gone is just really discouraging, man. Like... Yeah, I think my uh, Grand Theft Auto 4 review did like almost 3 million views or something on GT. Like to go from that to what happened because of the things I've talked about in the last 30 minutes or so is really discouraging. But yeah, I would say Invisible Walls episode 200, probably my favorite moment uh, of all the Invisible Walls in this. Mm -hmm. A lot of people mentioned the RE6 debate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's one of the famous debates. There's another one for, uh, let's see, what was it? Fallout New Vegas was another one. Mm -hmm. A lot of people like get on me because the, what people don't realize, I've always been the host of everything. And as the host, it's like it's your job to make the conversation interesting and fun and keep it moving. Consequently, that also makes you the bad guy a lot of times because you have to like cut somebody off and like get the conversation going in another direction when they're rambling on. You have to sometimes try to generate interesting discussion when there is none by providing a counterpoint or being the devil's advocate or saying things that you know most people are going to be like, screw you. Like, so yeah, a lot of people point to like two or three things in my career out of like the hundreds of thousands of things that I've done. But I think probably a lot of people in the public sector have to deal with the same thing. Yeah. And um, 
See, Jay, Re Jay Reedvik 7 uh, also has something similar during the trailer that I noticed, but is it bad that despite the gaming industry growing exponentially, the interest in news and information is being devalued because of pessimism and mistrust? What's the future of video game news websites? There may not be a future. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. It's like, you know, people say it's easy. I see a lot of people telling, like, uh, the GT guys to start a Patreon or whatever. And, uh, but see, the, that's easy to do if it's one or two guys or a YouTube channel. Like, if it's one or two people and you only have to support a couple people, it's not a big deal. But when you start talking about, like, more than two, like, even three, and then four, five, six, seven, or whatever, it gets a lot more difficult because every person is taking a chunk out of that pie. And when you start talking about having to buy all the gear, because you take a lot of things for granted when you work for a company. They supply all the gear. They supply your location. Like, you know, I had to rent a location. Our studio, I pay rent on that every month. I pay the bills on the location every month. Like, people don't realize all these other expenses when you've worked for a company all this time that is paid for by the company. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's very easy to become all warm and cuddly up in the corporate bosom. Um, so there's a lot of challenges involved with starting something. So it's very easy to be like, why don't you just do this? Why don't you just don't, why don't you just do that without thinking about what really that all entails? And look, I was a little guilty of it too. Anytime you start a business, you don't know everything. You think you do and you do all this research and you think you know all the ins and outs. You don't. Stuff comes up that you didn't realize. I didn't realize I needed like insurance for like my location and for my business. Like there's just all kinds of things that are involved with starting a company. It's not as just simple as being like, okay, I'm starting this today. Here's the name of it. Let's go. It just mm. doesn't really work that way. Um, so I think it's going to continue down the road it is. Like I wouldn't be surprised if in five years the only guys left standing are IGN. I honestly would not be surprised. Um, I could see that. I feel like Kotaku will probably hang on. Yeah. Just because yeah, it's you're part right. of the Gawker network. Well, again, they're a little different, too. They're a blog. Right. And they're like the blog. So I, you're right. I could see them probably holding on. but Or, or the smaller guys who haven't relied on any of the corporate bullcrap mm -hmm. to survive all this time. Like, like Polygon's like, probably got some juice in it. Uh, I don't look, know what their I, numbers I, I, are look, like, though. Here's, I don't want to talk about a lot of this stuff because I know a lot of the people that work at these places and right. I love them to death and they've been my colleagues for years. So I don't want to be like, oh, your website is doomed and it's not going to succeed. You asked a question. I'm just saying mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if in five years IGN is one of the few big corporate websites left standing. Um, they're a juggernaut and they have more traffic mm -hmm. than God and, and I still they can they can weather the storm I think you'll start to see like the publishers themselves sort of creating their own faux press outlet which they already have division. with their YouTube several, channels several of them already have that in that regard you've got yeah. you, know, you know that's basically what the you know the Nintendo Treehouse thing was I mean so basically I think you'll you're gonna see the publishers increasingly cut the middleman out yeah they're gonna try to get straight to you because they can mm -hmm. manipulate the message and control the message I don't think it's a pretty place where everything's headed. I don't think that. I do like the idea that it's very easy to produce video now, though, and that people, as long as they have a little bit of motivation and a good idea, can do something and be a success. You know, a lot of people hate on PewDiePie. I have all the respect in the world for that guy. I don't give a crap about his content. I've never made it through one of his videos. But the bottom line is the guy busts his ass and works hard. He had a vision, and he's successful. Like, I never begrudge people who are successful. And uh, he did it the right way. He did it with hard work, just like I mentioned earlier. So... I just think it's going to keep going down this path. Any last minute questions before we get up out of here? Uh, Zellos, Wilder, what are Defy even doing with GT now? I read somewhere today that they're going to redirect GameTrailers.com probably to some other property mm. on Defy already. That's pretty much how it works. They might, they might try to sell the URL. I mean, they could probably get a pretty penny for GameTrailers.com. Um, yeah. But then again, I feel like people who know wouldn't visit it out of principle. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like you're just not be like, gonna, I'm not going to that website. I don't I care like what it is. To, you're not going to be able to like replace it. Yeah, at least I hope not. I hope people wouldn't uh, wouldn't go to and support a site with the GameTrailers.com URL after what's happened. So at some point, you got to draw on the line in the sand and take a stand. It'll probably just redirect to Smosh Games and probably it'll be that murder their YouTube channel or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um. I see one here from Simi1101. Are you interested in doing content that GT has done on Sifted? Uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> no doubt about it. I mean, they make great shows, uh, great personality-driven shows. Um, like I said, you subscribe, we hire. 
and we'll bring them in here. And if they don't want to do the shows that they were doing before, that's fine. They're creative people. They can come up with new ideas. Um, like in the case of Pactor, when we brought him over to Sifted, like the way he is with his schedule, with his work, like he just really couldn't do any type of a show but the one he was already doing. It's just the way his schedule's worked out. It's what he's used to. Uh, if we were to do something crazy disruptive with him, it just wouldn't work with his schedule and everything. So hmm. so don't use Pactor as an example of, oh, if we brought other people over from GT to Sifted, if it would just be the same shows they were working on before. If they wanted to do that and the demand was there from it, from our, for it from our users, sure. But at the same time, I wouldn't bring them in here and be like, you have to do the final Bossman or you have to do Trailer Academy or anything else that they've done before. Like, you know, you have to let creative people be creative. And chances are they may have gotten sick of doing those shows after a while. So, yeah, I would never, I would not force them to do anything that they didn't want to do, I guess is the best way to sum it up. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, we don't have an answer to this, uh, but it is an interesting question from SMC92. And will all the content still be up? From GT, I don't think it will. I I have already heard that there's stuff getting broken already. Yeah. See, here's the thing: is uh, bandwidth. It's come down a lot, but it's still really freaking expensive. Yeah. Like really expensive. Um, like, you know, there's people that are trying to like rip the whole channel and like you know save as much as they can. Yeah. Um, which is probably wise because I don't know how long that's going to be there. Yeah, because Defy is going to look at all that content as a liability, and in fact, I'm betting they're already looking at it as a liability because people are probably hammering their servers trying to get all the content off of them before it gets shut down, and uh, it's expensive. It costs a lot of freaking money, and uh, so I would not be surprised. If all that stuff starts coming down, there are people grabbing stuff and archiving it. I think Matt just mentioned it. Um, I don't know if you guys visit NeoGAF, but there's people on there who are actively like banding together to try to get all the content down, which is awesome. Whoever's doing that on NeoGAF, you are the man. And it sucks because what I thought about yesterday, and I'm like, wait a minute, like seven years of my life and all the work I did and all my guys did is about to just get wiped out with the press of a button. I mean, that's what really sucks about working on the internet. Yeah. Is that... It also happens with tele. I mean, you know, we did 1,300 episodes plus of X-Play, and I got, you know, a handful of those on, you know, DVD duplication. But yeah, most of those are gone. I know. I can't find them. Because I was putting together a reel at one point, and uh, I could not find hardly any of the episodes anywhere mm. online. So they're going to go down, people. But the good news is there are people proactively working to get all that stuff before it's gone. I mean, those retrospectives... Uh, pop fiction. There were so many awesome shows. Pop fiction shows. was a good show. All, I mean, there were so many good shows on yeah. GT, and they're just like someone's gonna flip a switch, and it's just poof, mm-hmm. it's gone. So, all digital future. Yeah. 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 All right. Do we have anything else, or is that it? Um. Somebody asking you to talk about the Doritos Pope thing. I don't know if that's wise. No, I will talk about it, yeah. because that's bullshit. Was that during the heavy ads era? It was Wagrook. No, it was Well, look. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it was. It was after that point. But there's nothing wrong with what Jeff did there. There's nothing wrong at all. That's sponsorship. That's like how... That's exactly what I was talking about. That's him trying to alleviate the load of ads on game trailers. Because if you just... Look, you do a sponsorship with Doritos and Mountain Dew. There's no conflict of interest there. Doritos and Mountain Dew aren't making video games. Like, there's no conflict there at all. He could, you can make on a sponsorship like that, $200,000, $300,000, whatever. It depends on whatever is wrapped into it. You realize how many ads that takes away from people who are on your site watching videos? To make $200,000 or $300,000 serving video ads, it is like, millions of video views millions and that was what i was talking about earlier when i was going out on calls with these people trying to set up stuff like that so that the ad frequency on the website would go down so you guys would enjoy coming to the website so look and that's why i was also the watchdog who was there to be like nope that's not going to work that'll sacrifice our editorial integrity jeff did nothing wrong like people took that and ran with it i think it's disgusting what people did with it to be honest with you Jeff's an awesome guy. Jeff also knows a whole hell of a lot about editorial integrity. And uh, I think he got a bad rap over that. And I feel bad over that whole thing. So 
regardless of whether it was during the ad era or whatever, it's irrelevant. The bottom line is he did nothing wrong. He sat there in a chair presenting something for Doritos and Mountain Dew. So what? People do it every damn day. There's no difference between that and someone running an ad before you con your content or having a baked in ad before the content runs that says, eat some Doritos. Who cares? It's the big deal. I just had to get that out of my chest. That's been, I've been sitting on that one for a while. This rant brought to you by Mountain Dew Kickstarter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Puppy monkey baby. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, man, there's so much. We we got. Yeah. I think we got to call it though. It's just there's so many questions. Yeah. They just keep rolling in. Um. So so here's the thing. I'm seeing all the suggestions from you guys about setting up like um, example like funding sites and stuff like that. Um. So I'm looking at all this. I'm gonna keep this chat and like. I won't close it, so I, when I go home after this show is over, uh, I can look at all these suggestions that you guys are giving me, and I'll certainly take them all to heart that I can and try to make it work. Um, also, thank you guys for the kind words that you're all putting in here. It really means a lot to me, because I did dedicate a lot of my life to GT, and it's good to see that you guys appreciate it. So, really appreciate it. I appreciate your support all these years, and I appreciate the people who stuck around at GT by the people who were there after I left, and nothing but love people. And I think for the fans, and for me even a little bit, like, it's closure. Like, it's hard sometimes when stuff like this happens, especially when you don't know what happened, and I hope maybe I provided a little bit of closure for you guys. And it felt good for me to do it too, because I've been sitting on a lot of this stuff for quite a while, ever since I left GT. Matt, thank you for, uh, <laughs> for... Sure. Riding along for this, man. I'm, I'm sure you're like sitting there at times, like, damn, I haven't said anything for 40 minutes. So uh, I appreciate this. Is, this is uh, this is game trailers this week, and uh, I wasn't a direct part of that. I could, I mean, I could tell a similar story about my adventures in cor yeah. corporate America. Our 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 G4 story uh, is much more television focused, but it's it's not uh, it's not entirely dissimilar. So it's it was inter It's in always interesting because I didn't know some of that because some of that's you know just been kept. Yeah, Probably. I haven't told, look, I'm telling, some of the stuff I just said is the first time I've said it to anybody, so, but that's what this was for for me, like it was, again, it was mm -hmm. for me and for you guys, so you guys would know what really happened, and so I could get it off my chest a little bit, yeah. so. I'm happy to sit and listen when, <laughs> when the big life events occur. Yeah, yeah. Well, once again, thanks everyone, especially the people in Europe, I know there's a bunch of you guys who stayed up until like 2 or 3 in the morning on like a <laughs> Wednesday night. 4 or 5 in the morning. Yeah, hopefully you guys aren't too beat tomorrow, but hopefully also it was worth it, because you did get something on this stream that has never been shared before. So, everybody have an awesome night, thanks again, uh, we'll be back next week, it's looking like next Thursday. Probably. Yeah, next Thursday. So. Thanks again. Thanks to the people who have subscribed to Sifted and who are supporting the site already. I know you guys, a lot of you are on the stream. Uh, thanks for a lot of new people. I've seen a lot of new people in our chat tonight. Thank you very much for showing up. Hopefully you'll come back and see us again next week. And I guarantee one thing, the show will be a lot more upbeat. <laughs> 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 it's been a tough week, man, for a lot of people. So again, thanks everybody. Everyone have a great night. Game Face is up and out.